talk on today coming up in Israel. The president arriving this morning. The message he's delivering about the war with Hamas and the explosion at a Gaza hospital that has escalated tensions throughout the region. Then, back in court, Joran Vandersloot set to face a judge in Alabama today. Could Natalie Holloway's family finally get answers about her disappearance? It was conditioned upon uh, Mr. Vandersloot revealing details of how Natalie died and how her body was disposed of. The details straight ahead. Plus, unfiltered, stunning revelations from Britney Spears' highly anticipated memoir, what she's sharing about growing up as a child star, the court order that controlled her life, and her relationship with Justin Timberlake. And snooze alert. New research just out this morning on what hitting snooze in the morning may do for your health. So should you smash that button and grab a few extra Z's? We'll break it all down today if you're up. Wednesday, October 18th, 2023. Traveled from Grosse Point Woods, Michigan. South Bend, Indiana. Athens, Alabama. Topeka, Kansas. McKeesport, Pennsylvania. And Bettendorf, Iowa. Shout out to my fellow journalism students at the University of Nebraska. Go Huskers! Wakefield, Rhode Island. Today is my 55th birthday. Visiting from Gilbert, Arizona. Thanks for babysitting, Mom. From Sheboygan, Wisconsin, celebrating our 30th anniversary. Good morning to our granddaughters. Mimi and Bob Bob love you. Invention marks the decline of human civilization. I think it would have to be the snooze alarm. The snooze alarm is based on the idea that when the alarm goes off, you are not getting up. You're not even awake, you're already a failure. <laughs> Hundred percent. I mean, Jerry was right. That was his take on the snooze button way back when. So if you reach to grab that extra rest, you're not by yourself. In fact, 69% of us admits doing it at least sometimes in a study out in the Journal of Sleep Research. Okay, the question, is it good for you to hit that snooze button? Dr. Carol Ash is a sleep expert at mm -hmm. RWJ Barnabas Health. Dr. Mm -hmm. Ash, good morning. You know yeah, you have a couple skeptics here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But go ahead, <laughs> say your piece why snoozing is good for you. Well, it all depends on how you're built. And that okay. is, are you a night owl or morning lark? And if you're a night owl, you're more likely to hit that snooze button. And right. that's because night owls will wake up in, in the deeper stages of sleep when the alarm first goes off. And when they wake up, they're more likely to be disoriented and have impairment in their mood and performance. Mm -hmm. So they'll hit the snooze button, the night owls. I feel like whenever I hit the snooze button and I think I'm getting 10 extra minutes, I actually wake up and feel much worse. I feel groggier. I feel more out of it. I always say to myself, put your feet on the floor, put your feet on the floor when the alarm goes yeah. off. There is something to that. There is, and that's what the study showed. As you noted, 69% of us are hitting the snooze button. And what happens is if you're that night owl, you're waking up in those deeper stages of sleep and you have what we call sleep inertia. That's that disorientation mm -hmm. and the, the mood impairment and the performance. But what the study showed is when you hit the snooze button, you actually wake up and have improved cognitive performance or better thinking, but your mood, you're still miserable and you're still drowsy. <laughs> and you hate yourself for yeah. pressing snooze. And now you're late. Now you're late. Now you're so, late. But just to be clear, so if you are a night owl, yes. the study is showing that if you hit the snooze button, mm -hmm. that 10 extra minutes of sleep does help you to a certain extent. Yes, mm -hmm. because okay. it takes you out of that deeper sleep into okay. lighter stages and you mm -hmm. wake up without sleep inertia. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and if you are an early morning person, if you're not a night owl. Yes, well, so th if your physiology, mm -hmm. if you're a night owl, but also for some of us, we're mm -hmm. sleep deprived and we have sleep disorders. So if, if you're not doing what you need to do to, to really have the best sleep hygiene, maintaining the, the environment for sleep, the cool, the dark and the quiet environment, then you're also likely to be hitting that snooze button and <laughs> waking up with all the problems that same as a night owl. I'm just curious, like, how do you know, other than just instinct, if you're a night owl or a morning yeah, person? What your normal rhythm well, is. You, most of us, if you are a night owl or a morning lark, the night owls tend to be more alert towards the evening hours. They like to exercise in the evening hours, mm -hmm. and the reverse would be true for the morning mm -hmm. lark. The research says, go away for two weeks and see what your sleep preferences are, and none of us really have time to no. do that, right? So you have to pay attention to throughout the day where you feel okay. more alert. Okay. I'm a lark. What about you? I'm a definitely <laughs> lark. We're lark. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ash. We You're appreciate very it. Welcome. Team Lark. Best time of the morning. Pop start. Pop start. Let's get All to right. it. Let's start with today. Big breaking news yesterday. 
I'm sure you heard about it in your inbox. Britney Spears, we're learning new details about the singer's upcoming new memoir, shedding light on her relationships, conservatorship, and some very private details of her life over the last 20 years. Erin McLaughlin has more. Hey, Erin. Hey, Carson, good morning. This is being billed as Britney in her own words, a chance for the 41-year-old star to reclaim the narrative after a 13-year-long conservatorship that kept her under the control of her father. Excerpts of The Woman and Me have just been released, and in them, Britney is not holding back, including a shocking account from her past relationship with Justin Timberlake. Over the years, Britney Spears has had high-profile successes and romances, public meltdowns, and a very public court battle that sparked a movement and helped her reclaim her freedom. And now the pop icon is telling all in an upcoming memoir, The Woman in Me, written with the help of a collaborator. Spears posting a video teasing the book last night. There's a lot that people don't know that I want them to know. Among the bombshell revelations, that she had an abortion decades ago after a pregnancy with then-boyfriend Justin Timberlake. That disclosure coming through excerpts of the memoir released early to People magazine. The pregnancy was a surprise, but for me, it wasn't a tragedy, Spears writes. I love Justin so much, I always expected us to have a family together one day. Justin definitely wasn't happy about the pregnancy. He said we weren't ready to have a baby in our lives, that we were way too young. The couple started dating when Timberlake was 18 and Spears just 17. The abortion, she recalls, is one of the most agonizing things I have ever experienced in my life. People editor Wendy Nagel interviewed Spears via email. So this is a secret that she's kept for more than 20 years. She knew becoming a mother was something she had always dreamed of. In the memoir, Spears also addresses what she calls the 13-year soul-crushing conservatorship that a judge terminated in November 2021. The woman in me was pushed down for a long time, she writes, while also admitting that her newfound freedom has been an adjustment. Lately, fans have expressed their concern for Spears after this recent post of the superstar dancing with knives that led to a police wellness check. Spears says the knives were fake and that she was imitating this Shakira dance. And now Brittany intent on reclaiming the narrative about her own life. Everyone has tried to define her and what she is. And she wants to say, hey, I get to decide now. And this is the first step in that process. Representatives for Britney Spears and Timberlake did not immediately respond to a request for comment from NBC News. As for Britney, People is reporting that right now she's really enjoying the simple life, traveling, watching her favorite TV shows, and enjoying this time to just be. The new issue of People is available Friday. Carson. A lot of people reading that book. Aaron, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Next up, Saturday Night Live. The numbers are in. Officially, season 49 already won for the record books. Oh. Let's go to our newest NFL sideline reporter, Kenny DeTulio, who's at MetLife Stadium. Kenny, what's the mood down there? Devastated, Kurt. Taylor is nowhere to be seen. When we get back, we are going to speak with someone who actually wants to talk football. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was from this weekend's premiere episode, which saw the highest ratings for a season starter since 2020 in the 18 to 49 demo. And SNL brought out some major celebrity cameos for Pete Davidson's big return as host. Saw Travis Kelsey there appearing in that sketch. Also, Taylor was in the house, introduced musical guest Ice Spice. John Mulaney popped into one of the pre taped skits they did. It was also the biggest SNL season premiere on Peacock, more than doubling last year's opener. SNL returns this weekend. Got Bad Bunny on the show pulling double duty, both hosts and musical guests. And then we've got the very funny Nate Bargetzi making yeah. his SNL debut yeah. alongside Foo Fighters. That's one to mark on your calendars. That'll be October 28th. The next up, Kelly Clarkson. This week, the Emmy winner's daytime talk show premiered from its new home right across the street in 30 Rock. And for her second karaoke of the season, Kelly was joined by Billy Porter for a gospel rendition of her song, Stronger. Oh, how about that note? Why are we there? Huh? 
How about that note? Wow. You could have got some chips and queso in the mouth on that note. Seriously? Oh, my God. That was unbelievable. And, uh, again, congratulations. Wow. congratulations to Kelly and her staff across the street. Great first week. Great yes. first week. All right, coming up, Jill's bringing you new steals and deals to help you stay warm and cozy as the temperatures drop. But first, your local news. Jill's Skills and Deals is sponsored by Wells Fargo Credit Cards. Credit cards made for the way you live. That's real life ready. Welcome back this morning on Steals and Deals, items for your home and your wardrobe, all to keep you cozy and warm as it gets cooler outside. Our friend Jill Martin Brooks is our lifestyle and commerce contributor. We got our QR code popped up right there on the screen. Jill, let's get cozy. Yeah, I mean, this is our life. Yes. And now on a deal. So who doesn't want this? Okay. okay. These are a triumph. <gasps> okay, the totes, rain boots for the whole family. They even have toddler sizes. Oh, how I know. Cute so, as but can this be. is such a great brand. They're waterproof, slip resistant, antimicrobial, machine washable. They're lightweight, easy to slip on and off, comfortable, tons of fun colors. Mm -hmm. The retail, 46 to 65. The deal price is $15, up to $77. Uh, percent off <gasps> and just look at the detail on oh, the back of them yeah, and you know and love this brand by the so. way beautiful sturdy reliable uh, what oh. we want in everything in yes. our life. oh god this i want this okay I need. so will you hold this up yes, for me I to will. show the size mm -hmm. the donnie waffle blanket scarf okay okay now yes. this is like it's a hat it's a it's a wrap <laughs> it's a scarf it's a blanket it's an everything I mean, cozy it's a, on your couch it's a very textured soft Take weave it on the plane yep machine yeah, washable I love turn it, it into and a scarf warm. um yeah and it has a brushed fabric on it mm -hmm. so you feel I like that, that extra feeling softness. yeah and use it in the house too as an elevated pop like just if you want to as a binge watching mm -hmm. blanket if you so i love that it up. Yeah. i love it i yeah. think it's awesome super soft so What's the deal the, price yeah, yeah. is 39 and retail is 149 74% off. Brilliant. So that's great. Okay. Cozy sets. So this is a Lala cashmere collection. The retail is 70 to 265. Now the problem with cashmere, yeah. delicious, yummy, fabulous, yeah. expensive, but you have to dry clean it. Dry clean it. Nobody likes that. Nobody wants to do As that. As you say that. So <laughs> this is actually machine washable. We have on the site how to do it on gentle or you can hand wash it. So that way, when you wear it, you don't feel like, I don't want to get anything no, on no, it. No, like no. life is messy as yes, we know. Yes, you're And right. so we have all different um, mm -hmm. all different uh, options. Yeah. You have the leggings, you have with the waistband, the elastic waistband, the cover-up, a bra in that fabrication so it's soft on your skin. It's a lightweight cashmere. This is a trust me material. You will love this. The deal price is 35 to 133 depending on the item, 50% yeah, yeah, off. This is like a, I should try it. And I love a good turtleneck also. And by the way, the texture of these leggings, you can tell they're warm and cozy. I love these. And it takes away the dry cleaning. Yeah, I delicious, that. I right? I want that too. Okay, let's get some slippers. Are you okay, so these? these? I am wearing Of course these. you are. So these are um, mm -hmm. in my house when you walk in. You know yeah. I have a no shoes home. Mm -hmm. So these are indoor, outdoor mm -hmm. shoes. Mm -hmm. But they're so comfortable. Butter. Yeah, Butter yeah. inside. They're from Dream and appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, they call them the clog slippers. Mm -hmm. The retail's $36. Again, 
You could wear them indoors and outdoors. They have okay. the faux fur lining all throughout. And the colors are Super on point. Super delicious. Yeah. And yeah, and just look at the sizing. I wear the eight to nine. Okay. Um, the deal price is $15. So for a stocking stuffer, yeah. I mean, this is just keep them in you the house. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't go wrong. Let's keep our drinks okay. nice and warm. Yes, and you can charge them while you're not, which is like, it's, it's a super un unusual combination, but it is what it is. Okay. It's the T-Smart <laughs> Heated Mug Kit 2.0 okay. bundle. So the retail is 137 So it has a smart heated coaster with USB charging. It's a two-in-one lid and drip tray. So you you know when you like you make tea? Yes. And, and you, then you, you have, forget about it, yes. and then it's cold. Uh -huh. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> and when you're not using the coaster, it is a charging I mean, I think this is brilliant. I saw this funny meme. It was like how to make iced coffee. Make coffee in the Keurig, have a child, and then that's it. And it's then you forget, and, and then you forget. Right. Yeah, that's so how it works. So this will fix that. That's brilliant. So the deal price is 55 and this package um, is exclusive to our Today viewers and mm -hmm. comes in uh, gray lilac or deep green mint. Beautiful. So, yeah. Beautiful. And now this. Okay. You know, remember the Seinfeld, like, well, you don't have a big salad. Could you yeah. put it in a big bowl? Well, that's what I love about these, and yeah. I have these in mm -hmm. my house. The yeah. Staub Ceramic 4 piece Beautiful. Bakeware set, the retail 187. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you get two stackable baking dishes and two universal bowls. So these are oven to table. So, Gorgeous. you know, love. you as a chef from the oven <laughs> you know to the what? table, you can serve it like this, uh -huh. and it looks great. <laughs> um, comes in three colors and mm -hmm. festive for the holidays, but these are great for just like every day. You want to eat cereal or a salad and you want a big bowl. <laughs> you want a lot. Elaine would like it. The retail, <laughs> 187, the deal, 65 for the set. That's 65% off. Okay, will you go over them one more time for us? I would love to. Thank the you. Totes, rain boots, the Donnie waffle blanket scarf, the Alala cashmere collection, the dream toe slippers, the teas heated mug bundle, and the style ceramic four-piece bakeware set. If we haven't told you today, we love you very much, oh, Jill love Martin. You love you very much. All right, start shopping. Scan our QR code, head to today.com slash deals so you know that we do make a commission through our links. We love Jill. We love Jill. Coming up next, Jen is here with Chef Bobby Flay's oh. touching tribute to his beloved cat, Nacho, a social media star in his own right. But first, this is Today on NBC. Some sad news shared yesterday by our friend Bobby Flay, the passing of his cat, which he loves so much, Nacho. Yeah, he held a special place in Bobby's life and career, and Jen is here with more. Hey, Jen. I've now turned into the cat correspondent, so we, we all know how hard the loss of a pet can be. They really do become part of the family. And it's no different for world-renowned chef and Food Network star Barbie Flay, who is now fondly remembering his nine years with Nacho. It was a bond like no other. Famed chef Bobby Flay and his feline friend Nacho, known as the feisty, inseparable duo. Nacho, want to taste? Nacho. 
the orange hair kitty seen by the chef's side on press appearances, taste testing new this. products, uh, even making his modeling debut in People magazine with Flay for the 2017 edition of The Sexiest Man Alive. He's 21 pounds. 21 pounds? Yeah, yeah don't mess with Nacho. Yeah. An unapologetic cat dad, Flay gushed earlier this summer over his two treasured pets, Nacho and Stella. I have two of them. I love them so much. Nacho wasn't just a sidekick, but a celebrity in his own right. The furry Maine coon amassing almost 300,000 followers on Instagram. Fans could not get enough of the cat's silly daily antics, acting as Flay's sous chef. Meet my inspiration, Nacho. But unlike some cats, Nacho wasn't known to lounge around all day, instead serving as the inspiration for his own food company, made by Nacho. Flay, a famously proud cat person, known for cooking for his pets before turning those recipes into a premium cat food brand. I created this company with my cat Nacho because it's time for cats to get the attention and the thoughtful recipes they deserve. While the 21-pound kitty brought joy to thousands for almost a decade, this morning, Flay sharing the heartbreaking message that Nacho passed away peacefully, writing, Nacho had a magic about him that was truly special. He came into my life when I needed him most and brought joyful moment after joyful moment to my household. Flay asking people to give your pets an extra long hug today and please say a short prayer for Nacho. They mean so much to all of us. His heartbreak shared across social media. Fellow celebrity chef Ina Garden writing, Oh, Bobby, I'm so sorry. What a good life you gave him. Flay says he takes comfort knowing Nacho's likeness and legacy will live on forever through Made by Nacho and in the hearts of those who loved him. Love Cat you. dads everywhere. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> Oh, uh, I mean, we all uh, know when a when a pet leaves, it's really, really hard. Yeah, and I have to say, can I just say happy yeah. birthday? Not to take time away from Nacho, but happy birthday to Hollywood. Your cat. My <laughs> cat. Yeah. Now we're talking Turned about one. Your cat. Yeah. Yes. Happy birthday. Can I show a picture? Oh, there she is. Oh. Oh. Hey, yeah. and when are they gonna have Barbie's dream kitchen? <laughs> I meant Bobby, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. By the way, birthday. I work with Jen on the 10. Holly makes it into <laughs> almost every one of our shows. No, I've now wow. become a book, queso, and cat, cat correspondent. Yes, you are. I'm pretty sure my yeah. parents have never been more proud. <laughs> You're cat lady no, now. I know. I'm may, still in mourning over Nacho. No, you guys I know. Are may Nacho rest in peace. Okay. No, we're no, not. We're, we're not. Because we're not. Nacho serious. rest no. in peace. Yes, yeah. of course. Right. Sorry, yeah. Thank you, Jenna. We love All you. All right. Bye. Coming up next, I see Joe Fire. That's good news. We talked about that. Tease it earlier. Remember the kid 15 years ago, one of the first viral videos? There he is. That's David after dentist. I remember. Has he been to the dentist since? I don't Maybe not. We're going to find out but first this is today on NBC oh. Oh God.
back and we are revisiting a classic video, one of the very first ones I think to truly go viral. Yeah, we're well, sure you know it uh, by three simple words: David after dentist. Morning news now and weekend. Today's Joe Fire caught up with him now. Ten years later, no more than that. Can yeah. you believe David's now 22 yeah. years wow. old? Wow, Jeez. 22. The video was recorded 15 years ago. Back then, David was seven, just had dental surgery, and was feeling the effects of the drugs. His dad actually didn't post the clip online until the next year. It's because he wanted to share it with friends and family. But the file was big. It was tough to email. So it was just easier to upload it to YouTube and send everyone the link. He just never imagined how many other people would watch too. How did it go? I didn't feel anything. His name is David DeVore, but you probably know him as... David after yeah. dentist. How do you feel about that that title? I uh, I love it. It's it's been a fun adventure. It's been its own part of my life. Starting with the part when he was seven and still feeling pretty loopy yeah. after dental surgery. I I feel funny. Why is this happening to me? A moment immortalized by his dad, David Senior. You know, you remember those times you always said, "If I only had a camera." Well, I actually had a camera that day. So I just got really lucky. That was it. In the two-minute clip, David Jr. is earnestly philosophical. One moment. Is this real life? Yeah, this is real life. Bluntly flustered the next. Stay in your seat. <laughs> the anesthesia, of course, did wear off, but the video's legend would only grow. But when you watch it, what's your favorite part? I think the end when I just like, ugh. Within days of posting it on YouTube back in 2009, the clip racked up a few million views. At that point, they were like, okay, I've heard of this thing called bi going viral. I think that's what we're doing. And what did you think? Um, I was just in shock. There was some backlash from those who thought dad was exploiting his son, but for the most part, folks loved it. Is this real life? The video was part of a Super Bowl ad for Vizio. Homer Simpson even referenced it on The Simpsons. Which of you is the YouTube of the kid high on dentist gas? You. And of course, they appeared on Today. My friends thought it was funny at first, but then later they stopped talking about it. You could have been embarrassed by it and yeah. wish it had never happened, or you could have your attitude. <laughs> Why do you think you have your attitude? I can only comprehend so much at that age. I was just kind of going with the flow, and I was like, oh, I get to go to New York. It's like, great, this is fun. People, like, I recognize people weren't making fun of me. They've made a number of licensing deals, not to mention the YouTube ad revenue, which was helpful during the 2009 recession. Had been selling real estate, and that went away overnight, so it, it literally, you know, saved us. Today, the video has racked up more than 140 million views. Does that just blow your mind? It does. Yeah, it's it's crazy. David is now a senior at the University of Florida studying computer science, not dentistry. When he was accepted here, the school's president reenacted David's viral moment. This is funny that you didn't bring it up. As for his classmates, at first, many didn't know David's identity. Dude, what? <laughs> He's just, I would have never known. He's very humble about it. and. He, he's never gone out of his way to tell me. And I didn't know that fact, and then someone told me later on, and I was like, no way. <laughs> but I was in the midst of fame. <laughs> Is this going to be forever? Turns out this moment did live forever. That's okay. It's still a welcome part. Is this real life? Of David's real life. So you might be wondering about David after graduation. He's going to get his diploma soon, plans to work in the computer science field. As for the video, it is kind of like a small business, something that does need to be managed, and Dad has been gradually turning over those responsibilities to the younger David. Oh. So Those are the days when going viral was like, meant something. Like it was, it, it was yeah. real. Yes. There now are, people try and go viral on purpose by doing all sorts of crazy yeah. stuff. Right. And it he never just worked. did that to send it to the uncles and the aunts, yeah. Yeah. and then two million people caught on. And he said, we tried to do it again, and just nothing ever, it was like lightning in a bottle. Like, yeah. they tried yeah. to do other be. videos, and it just, nothing stuck, and the kids weren't that into it the one time it happened, and that's yeah. good enough. Yeah, it was, enough. Yeah, it was real that Thank time. you. Thank you, yeah. Joe. We're glad David's doing well. And by, by the way, our friends over at Today.com, they also chat it with David so you can head to our website to check out his favorite move his favorite memory once mm -hmm. that video went viral
This morning on the third hour of today, in the war zone, President Biden arriving in Israel. I want the people of Israel, the people of the world, to know where the United States stands. The visit coming amid anger and accusations over a deadly blast at a Gaza hospital. We're live with the latest. Plus, our Consumer Confidential, an exclusive look at the new high-tech way we could soon be getting our packages. We are reimagining the future of robotics. When we visit the Amazon facility where robots rule. Plus, in She Made It, the inspiring CEO enjoying sweet success. What sparked her mission to make a better cookie dough. And a tail-wagging edition of The Upside. It's hard not to love adorable puppies. The classroom that's literally gone to the dogs and how it's helping kids learn. Today, Wednesday, October 18th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Uh, on a good Wednesday morning, welcome to this third hour of today. Craig, Chanel, Mr. Roker, Dylan Dreyer, so glad that you are with us once again. And we do have another incredibly busy morning. Mm -hmm. President Biden arriving in Israel overnight. He immediately met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Right now, President Biden is meeting with families and first responders there on the ground in Israel. That visit coming just hours after hundreds were killed and a blast at a large hospital in, in Gaza. Gaza, Hamas blaming an Israeli airstrike, but the Israeli military says it has proof another militant group within Gaza was responsible for that strike. That explosion, by the way, triggered a wave of protests across the region, and in response, a planned meeting between the president and leaders of several Arab nations was canceled. It is a volatile, evolving situation there on the ground. NBC News senior national correspondent Tom Yamas on the ground in Israel for us right now. Tom, good morning to you. Hey, Craig, good morning to you. This is one of the most tense times that I've ever seen during this war. It's because of what happened at that hospital in Gaza where hundreds have died. Iran now calling on other Arab nations to open multiple fronts against Israel. Again, this is just sort of adding fuel to the fire right now because of the tense situation here. This, as President Biden has a very busy morning here, as you laid out all the people he's meeting with, including the Israeli war cabinet, and making one thing very clear, the U.S. stands with Israel. President Biden in Israel this morning while the Middle East is in turmoil. The president meeting Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in a show of solidarity following last week's Hamas terrorist attack that killed more than 1,400 in Israel and at least 31 Americans. We will continue to have Israel's back as you work to defend your people. We'll continue to work with you and partners across the region to prevent more tragedy to innocent civilians. As protests continue from the West Bank to Tunisia and crowds approaching the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, reacting to that deadly blast at a hospital in Gaza that killed hundreds. Hamas blaming Israel for the explosion. The Israeli military strongly denying that, saying it was caused by a Palestinian rocket that misfired, launched not by Hamas, but another militant group, Islamic Jihad, which says the accusation is false. Biden seeming to side with Israelis this morning. And based on what I've seen, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not, not you. Another major priority for the president, the release of hostages taken by Hamas, including Americans, and the safe passage of humanitarian aid into Gaza and the opening of the Rafah crossing where many, including Americans, are waiting to leave. We have to also bear in mind that Hamas does not represent all the Palestinian people and uh, has brought them only suffering. He's encouraging life-saving uh, capacity to help the Palestinians who are innocent caught in the middle of this. The president had been planning to discuss those issues with President Mahmoud Abbas and Jordanian and Egyptian leaders. That summit now canceled in the wake of the hospital attack. One of the harsh realities we are seeing on the ground here in Israel is that Israel's main mission, as they said from the get-go after that terrorist attack, was to destroy completely Hamas, to wipe them off the face of the earth. What we're seeing, though, it is impossible 
to destroy Hamas and not destroy Gaza. And you are seeing those pictures all throughout the Gaza Strip right now. And this has complicated President Biden's trip here, right, because he was supposed to, as we reported, meet with other leaders of Arab nations, including Egypt and Jordan. And right after that hospital attack, which both sides are blaming each other for, the leaders of those Arab nations immediately canceled that meeting. Mm. Guys, back to you. Hey, Tom, we, we've seen you reporting from all around Israel the last few days. I, I can't help but notice the stores open behind you. What is daily life like there? Yeah. Yeah, the stores here are, are definitely open, and, and there were people on the streets. It's 4 o'clock right now in the afternoon. Uh, daily life for Israelis are there will be air raids, and people will, will run to shelters, or they'll run underneath to their safe rooms. Uh, we were speaking to somebody who lives in the area here saying that, that right around this time, over the next few hours, are when all the rockets from Hamas, from Gaza, start to be fired over Israel. The Iron Dome intercepts those missiles, but it's a very dangerous time. So, so right around now, people start going back to their homes, start to seek safe shelter. But look, during the mornings, during the afternoons, people are out and about. We were in Jerusalem speaking to, to merchants there, speaking to everyday people. Look, they have to live during war, right? This is life during war. But at the same time, the war consumes them. So as soon as you start talking to people, the first thing that comes up is the war. When you speak to Israelis, the first thing they mention, of course, is that Hamas terrorist attack. People here will never forget that. And they don't want the world to forget that either. And when you speak to Palestinians, the first thing they mention, obviously, are the bombings in Gaza. So it, it is consuming everyone here. They're trying to live their life like every single day, but it, it is a war. Absolutely. The juxtaposition of the video behind you, the pictures, and then the pictures we see from Gaza. Yes. It's just a tough situation. Tom Yamas, thank you. Stay safe, Tom. And be sure to stay with NBC News and NBCNews.com throughout the day for the latest on the situation in the Middle East and, of course, the president's visit. Okay, we want to take a turn now to our Consumer Confidential as we head into the busy holiday shopping season. A lot of people are going to rely on Amazon, of course, to get everything on those wish lists. So this morning, we've got an exclusive look at the new way those gifts get from add to cart mm -hmm. to <laughs> on your doorstep. NBC News senior investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn is Hi, here with more. Vic, yes, this is switching gears literally, and I'm glad to do it. I hope yeah. to give people something else to think about, you know, just mm -hmm. a small break from all, all right. of this difficult news. Good morning to you. Today, Amazon officially unveils its new cutting edge delivery technology. And we got to see firsthand how the company is now working to get your orders out faster than ever. From robots to artificial intelligence, Amazon says it's revolutionizing the way consumers get their orders. It comes as e-commerce sales are predicted to grow at least 10% this holiday season, reaching $278 billion, according to Deloitte. Amazon alone estimated to deliver 13 and a half million parcels each day. And it's all about innovation. I'm inside Boss 27. This is a state-of-the-art facility just outside of Boston. And with me now is Amazon's chief technologist for robotics, Ty Brady. Ty, thanks for being here. My pleasure. So this is the first time the public will see some of the new technology you are rolling out for the holidays. What happens in a lab like this? We are reimagining the future of robotics so that you can do your holiday shopping even better. Today, Amazon launches Sequoia, its brand new robotic system in Houston. The company says it's capable of stocking merchandise 75% more quickly and delivering your orders 25% faster. What was the problem you were trying to solve with Sequoia? We want to offer a wider selection for our customers. We want to do that in a very efficient manner so we can pass on a low cost to our customers. Brady says Sequoia also makes it safer for employees, reducing the number of accidents and repetitive stress injuries. So you don't have to get on a ladder, you don't have to bend down on your knees, you don't have to reach up uh, really high. They're able to bring these totes from the warehouse to a okay, workstation so like this, where I met up with David so Guerin, who helped open. design and build Sequoia. A machine has gotten this item out of the warehouse, brought it over here, and now what happens? Now the associate finds the item uh, that's up on the screen, so we take it out. This is a yellow phone we, case. We scan it. Okay. We put it in uh, a tote to be sent to another part of the building for packaging. We let the system know it's, it's, it's in there. And then this will cycle through and deliver us another tote to pick something else out of. And just how do those towers move around? Meet Hercules. Today is graduation day. The finished robots form a line and drive themselves onto their own shipping pallets where they'll head off to work at fulfillment centers around the world. Amazon is also introducing Digit. This new bipedal robot can grab and move orders in warehouse spaces not designed for humans. So I think something a lot of people are curious about is what happens between the time they click buy now 
and the product arrives at their doorstep. You're going to walk me through that. Sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to buy what is a bestseller on Amazon right All now. All right, very good. The Instant Pot. It's going to be hot this holiday, too. Be hot, right on your phone, ready to go. Okay, I'm going to add it to my cart. By the time you did that, yeah. I've sourced every Instant Pot in inside our network to figure out what's the best way to, to bring that to your house. The system found my Instant Pot at a fulfillment center in Penns Grove, New Jersey. From there, it was driven to Carteret, New Jersey, where it was boxed, labeled, and loaded onto another truck headed for a distribution center in the Bronx. That's where the delivery van picked it up and dropped it off the next day at 6.48 p.m. to me. Welcome to my office. The company also has more than 10,000 Rivian electric vans across the U.S. to reduce its environmental impact. Branson Ramirez drives one. I can do about 150 stops, uh, maybe 250 to 300 packages. New technology evolving to get us what we want faster and more sustainably this holiday season. And if you are wondering whether the robots are taking jobs away from people, well, Amazon says it has been tracking this, and they say that over the t last 10 years, they've added hundreds of thousands of jobs, 700 new job categories, like engineers who help design the jobs, sh the robots, rather. So, you know, jobs evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, Amazon's not the only one. So Amazon just opened three new fulfillment centers. They've added a bunch of drone delivery sites, 36 of them. Mm -hmm. Target is adding 100,000 workers for the holiday. So everybody is really mm -hmm. gearing up this time. Yeah, I do want to apologize for the times that I get upset that I can't receive something next day <laughs> and I have That's to wait funny. two days because I see that there is now a whole process <laughs> and most things can get delivered. We're so like spoiled. That. I know we, we are, are really spoiled. Are so exactly. spoiled. Yeah. Now they're actually testing you can say I want it at breakfast time or lunch time or dinner time and so That's, That's nice. wild. wild. It's incredible. Yeah. Well we're wow. gonna give you something right now. A <laughs> fascinating <you>. wellness <laughs> Wednesday. We've heard all about the power of positive thinking, but could it actually improve our health as we age? We're gonna dive into that. Then later in the upside Puppies unleashed inside a classroom. I'm waiting to hear the impact it's having on these kids. Aww. Third hour today, I'll be right it's back. Really not in two day. days, not in one day. Right back. Morning and Wellness Wednesday, we are talking about aging and specifically how we think about it. Recent studies show a link between our attitude about getting older and how long and well we live. Mm. So here to explain it all is psychiatrist Dr. Samantha Boardman. Dr. Boardman, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. So I think, you know, we all age. It, it's inevitable. But how we handle it and our attitude towards it, I think, makes a big difference. Well, people who have positive beliefs and a positive mindset about aging live longer and healthier mm. lives. And this isn't woo-woo. This is not <laughs> magical thinking. Actually, studies show they have better cognitive functioning. They are more physically active. They sleep better. They're less likely to be depressed. So they live longer and have more life in their years. Mm. I, I feel like you're a prime <clears throat> example of this. There's some people who, as they age, Get they better. seem to be more positive. Yes, they seem to we're get We're sort younger. of like fine wines, you know, that we do seem <laughs> to like, get, you know, like happier. Job. And there's actually something called the paradox of aging and that people tend to get happier. They're mm. less attuned to, like, the minutia, mm -hmm. less attuned to the drama and more paying attention to the delight. And I, I've also found that, you know, like, Part of this is there are these these benefits like, you know, like suddenly you're you're trying to get more active. You're trying to be a little more healthy, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, absolutely. And this idea that sort of our brains are predicting machines. Sort of, so what we pay attention to on expectations really shape our experience and how we respond to something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, imagine you um, are 65 years old one day and you wake up with a bad back and it hurts. And if you have a positive mindset about aging, you might think, hmm, what can I do about that? 
about this. Maybe or you could think, I, I'm lucky I woke up. Yeah. Uh, well, well, that's for sure. But that optimistic mindset really sort of informs your decision making. If you think, oh, there's nothing I can do, mm -hmm. this is sort of all right. downhill, you're less likely to do anything about it. And why does that, why does that connection exist? Well, there's this mind-body connection and how our brains really inform our behaviors, what we do, as you're saying, if we sort of decide to exercise or take care of ourselves in ways, but also on more of a cellular level, mm -hmm. that people who have positive beliefs about aging have lower levels of cortisol in their blood, which is a marker of stress as mm. well. So it's sort of in our you know, behavior, in our bones, and in our bodies. You know, it's so interesting. I can't tell you how many people will pull me aside or message me or stop saying your age, you know? And it's like, I just feel like if we keep doing that, mm -hmm. it almost puts the shame on aging. So for people who are watching or listening and they just dread aging and look, it's not easy, right? Are there things that you can do to kind of reframe that mindset or any advice you can give? Because we can say it, but there are people who really dread it. Well, language matters. And, you know, from the moment we're born, we're aging. But even starting at an earlier age, in your 20s and 30s, do we think of it as synonymous with decline, with sort of a downhill spiral? People do. Or do we see it as also a gateway of something to look forward to? What are you, how are you going to challenge yourself? What do you hope to do? And that this attitude, sort of reframing it and seeing it, focusing less on what you're sort of losing, but more on what you might be gaining. Mm. Acknowledging what's what's ahead as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. And looking forward to that. And so thinking about sort of what are the what what can I do? What are the actions that I could take to sort of, you know, allow for and promote healthy aging? And one of those would be thinking about the people in your yes. life mm -hmm. and also how your sense of purpose in your life and how you play. So we know having close social networks is really reliably important for health, all of our health at all ages of our lives, but especially as we age, having what they call intergenerational friendships, mm -hmm. like having a bouquet of friends, people of all ages making new friends, and people always find unexpected joy from those yeah. social connections. This has been helpful. Yeah, I especially, that. I think, uh, the other thing that helps people, if, especially if you enjoy your job yeah. Yeah, as a, unlike our parents who you know got out Didn't at 65 yeah. you know is staying in your job so yeah. sorry Dylan yeah. but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want him to live long don't you I do yeah. <laughs> just, not, right just not just yeah. not here anyway, <laughs> That's funny. Dr. Boardman thank you, thank so, you much. so much hey when we come <laughs> back a doggone good idea classroom where kids and dogs are learning side by side and when do you see the results then later we've got good housekeeping out with their kitchen awards the latest gear to make a meal like a breeze <laughs> like that mini garden growing right on your counter and they've got another item that i think is a game changer really? it's third hour today i'll be right back what is it don't tell them don't tell them Now for our series, The Upside, except this morning we're going to call it The Pup Side <laughs> because we're taking you to a school where puppies and kids are sharing a classroom. And it's not just adorable. Our weekend today co-anchor Peter Alexander found out it's also helping kids learn. I love that. Peter? Hey guys, this is certain to make you smile. Six-year-olds and eight-week-old puppies. Pretty cute, right? But that also sounds like it could certainly be pretty chaotic. So we went to check it out for ourselves, and I was totally impressed by just how well it worked for the first graders, a real-time lesson in empathy and responsibility, and even their reading scores have improved. And for those puppies, tons of attention and love. 
<laughs> That's what it started. Where go? So it's not exactly your normal school greeting, but at Hanby Elementary in Wilmington, Delaware, it's just the way Brooke Hughes's first graders like it. I built puppy. Hughes has always been an animal lover, and after fostering several puppies during the pandemic, a light bulb went off. What did the school say when you said, "So I have an idea. Right. I want to bring puppies to the classroom." Right. There was a lot of questions, um, but they said after I kept. Telling all the research about how dogs and puppies, you know, can increase, you know, productivity and mental health. They said, all right, you get one day. That one day turned into the rest of the school year and the beginning of Foster Tales Puppy Therapy, a program Hughes created that she says has changed how her students learn. We've seen a benefit in their reading scores because if they have puppy time, if the puppies are asleep, they have to read to them. And so their reading confidence has soared. And the kids that were like, you know, hesitant to pick up a book and read, they couldn't wait to read to a puppy. These days, these first graders' classmates include a pair of eight week old Husky Pit Bull mixes, Kelsey and Graham, fittingly a tribute to their favorite Philadelphia Eagles players, not far away. Hughes brings Kelsey and Graham home every night, but during the days, they've taught these kids to do more than just cuddle and play. The empathy with each other and the patience with each other, I've seen that being a huge growth since before we had puppies. Every morning they have to do a little check-in. How are you feeling today? This year, almost every day, they circle excited and I say, how are you feeling today? Like, I'm excited because I get to come to school with puppies and you. As a teacher, you can't ask for a lot more I can't that. ask for I mean. If you, I think my number one job as a teacher in this grade is to make school fun, make learning fun, the rest will come. And it's coming quick. Just look at the poster Sydney made. Will you read it for me? Okay. okay. Adopt a dog because they are playful and they like treats and they like naps. They do like naps. 20 puppies have now come through Hughes' classroom before finding their forever homes. Lincoln, why do we want these puppies to be adopted? So they can have a home. We want them to find a home forever, right? And this video she posted of her kids and the puppies bonding went viral. With nearly 3 million views. People lost their TikTok minds. <laughs> yeah. And I had no idea it was going to blow up. Why do you think it resonated? I think... Seeing the joy that the kids had, and they fell in love with kids reading to them, of course. That puppy love has helped all of her students, including Logan, who is mostly nonverbal and uses this device to communicate. I like to read to Kelsey and Graham. He just came out of his shell. He came out of his shell, but he also taught us that he knows more than we knew. He was reading an above grade level book to the puppies. Wow. Good job. Good job. Woof. It's not just the kids that benefit, but the puppies too. If they weren't here, they would be in a cage most of the day at the shelter. And here they're being socialized. They're learning all kinds of different sights and sounds and smells. Socialization for the puppies. Oh yeah. Learning for the kids. Yep. I mean, who wouldn't want to learn like this? It's hard not to love adorable puppies, oh. right? Are you being adorable? Are you being adorable, of. Graham? Oh, whoa, Bumble! Are you trying to... Whoa, that was a French one. <laughs> I have to say that Graham is quite the kisser. First, a quick shout-out to Rags to Riches Animal Rescue in Pennsylvania, where all the puppies come from. The good news here, Kelsey and Graham, they have now been adopted. Kelsey by a retired teacher, actually, from the school. The kids, of course, are definitely going to miss their friends, but they're going to make some new ones quickly. Miss Hughes, guys, told me this week she picked up three teeny corgi mixes that will be headed to the classroom real soon. Back that's to really, you. That, really that's sweet. That's great. That's Love really that. Sweet. Peter, thanks so much for bringing us that. Coming up, award-winning gear for your kitchen, including the sparkling gadget that will jazz up any drink. Then later in She Made It, a booming business that's so much more than just making dough. Jill Martin Brooks oh, with so. an inspiring entrepreneur yeah. with a message we all need to hear. Third hour of today, we'll be right back.
This is great. We're All excited. right, we have something Stop special. Drinking. Well, because she's, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what this is. <laughs> so this morning, every year actually, Good Housekeeping tests hundreds of products for their Kitchen Gear Awards. And we have a first look this morning at some of the tools and gadgets that they picked this year. This is such a treat. Nicole uh, Papantonio is the director of Good Housekeeping Kitchen Appliances and Innovation Lab. Good morning to you. Hi, Good thank morning. you. You guys have some really Hi. cool things this year. Yes, and I'm so excited because we're finally done. The winners are out, and this is a glimpse. Right here, we have the Aero Garden. So they're one of the first brands that came out with this indoor garden. Self-watering, you see it has a light, and Ooh. you can grow all these beautiful plants. So this is some Thai basil, yeah. some fresh basil. We have wow. some parsley that's starting. Mm -hmm. And this is actually my sister. So it's real. You see it's been growing for about six months now. You stole your sister's garden? And we went to Long Island <laughs> yesterday to Bar. get it. So if this you want to so cut some basil, you that's have fresh brilliant. basil year-round, which is it's so it's exciting. It's perfect for people who don't have a lot of space. Yeah. Exactly. That's why you can this is their slim design. Design, and this is the one that won an award this year. That's really They keep cool. innovating, which we love. Tell right, us about these now. I love, oh, so yeah. that's cut so beautifully. Ooh, this is from Victorinox. Cute. Wow, these are good, good knives. They that's a good are. Knife. That's a good knife company. And they're a really good value knife. This one has a wooden handle, and you see it's sliding through like yes. butter. Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. nice. Butter, baby. And our testers love that they could use it for yeah, steak, for yeah. tomatoes yeah. that are really hard. You could shift and add some basil, which means just cut and see beautiful mm -hmm. strips. And it's really nice, and it makes it so much easier in the kitchen when you have a good knife that you can like mm. trust, rely on. It's a game changer. Clean, easy. Mm. Well, this so, is this yeah. is what Chanel was drinking at the top. Yeah. Of the so help Second yourselves. Here. This is the drink mate. So we got a lot of submissions so cool. for sparkling water makers. Okay. This one can actually do anything, including orange juice or oh. this rosé that you're drinking. So instead of having to add extra seltzer, it just makes it bubbly. Gives Ooh. a little bubble. Exactly. Cool so that? this was flat before. Yep, it was just a regular this. bottle of rosé wow. that we put into the bottle mm -hmm. and it has this unique valve on the top that releases the gases so it won't splatter all over you. That so that's why really you're able cool. to use it. Nice. I love that. We were talking about this one earlier too, the separation on the little bacon. It's really fun. I think it's so innovative. This is from Good Cook. So the sheet pan is the one that won an award, won an award and basically you can cook different things at I the same that. time without the juices mixing up. Oh, so, that's a good idea. Yeah. So for me, I hate like when my fish is on like my vegetables, yeah. but I love both separately. And then you see we have some chicken, some veggies. If you have some picky eaters, you don't have to like go the extra mile. Oh, wow. Really just keep it separate. Everything bakes this at the same time. It's kind of like having an air fryer. Except it's not air fried. I love that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Let's say you want to upgrade your pots and pans. So what I love about these pots and pans, they're from Farberware. They're really Farber lightweight. Farberware's been around forever. Yes. And these are made of recycled aluminum. So them too, they're really innovative. And you could pick it up. It feels lightweight. So you're like, oh, it should be heavier. It performed really well in our tests. It heats very evenly. It cool. made a beautiful steak. And you see that has these lovely handles that are just really cool. easy to grab that you can And the fact that it's light clean. makes it so much easier yes. to like pour it onto a plate. And That's it's cool. non-stick, so it makes cleanup really easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then finally, I this, because uh, I'm always misting, but then exactly. sometimes I want to pour the oil. Exactly. And I got to unscrew the top. Oh. And the other thing to it's know, genius, right? most people don't know that the non-stick sprays that you buy in the can actually make non-stick appliances mm -hmm. sticky because it leaves uh, behind residue. Mm -hmm. So when you have your oh, own, you can choose brilliant. whatever oil wow. you put in there. And so it's a really fine that's mist. That's cool. And oh, it's that's really, awesome. yeah, so it's really, really fine. And it can go for busy. your air yeah. fryer treats that you just need a light coat of oil. That's cool. If you're trying to be conscious of how many calories yeah. you're eating, put Wait, it says $8.99? That's pretty yeah, cheap. Really, that's good. That's not bad. Really I'm affordable. Excited. You know what? It's something you wouldn't buy for yourself, and then you get it, and it's like, oh, thank exactly. you. Exactly. Look at that. Thank you, Nicole. All right. Well, how do it know? How do it know? How do it know? Uh, to see more winners from Good Housekeeping's Kitchen Gear Awards, just head to today.com slash shop. These were solid. Coming yeah, up in cool. She Made It, One Smart Cookie. Oh. Joe Martin Brooks met an inspired, yeah, thank you. Joe Martin Brooks met a really inspiring cancer survivor who's on a mission to make a better snack. Ooh. Joe's back right after this.
are back with another great She Made It. Today, lifestyle and commerce contributor Jill Martin Brooks is here with a really inspiring story about a, a cookie dough entrepreneur, huh? Yeah, and you know what? This just really shows you you can hold two things at one time. Yeah. Okay. You can be devastated and going through something horrible and also be motivated. Mm. And I think it's, it's super interesting. So Lauren Castle's story resonated with me in a major way after cancer kicked her down to what she calls her rock bottom. She found something very sweet on her way back up, her purpose. Mm. I do look at life like it's so precious. That's why I love being an entrepreneur. It's like, I did it. I gave my all every day. Lauren Castle knows a thing or two about perspective. She's the founder and CEO of Sweet Lauren's, a better for you cookie dough brand. She's also a cancer survivor. I know you know I'm currently battling cancer, and so I find it so fascinating and empowering that you found some positive in the mess. There is such community here, there's such support, and it is so hard to go through it. And to find some way to turn something so negative and scary into your biggest strength, it's what got me through. Lauren was just 23 and a recent graduate of the University of Southern California when she was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. It was the first time I was truly just depressed and I didn't know what my life would look like in the future, if I would ever get healthy, if I would ever be happy again. I think after like about two, three months of that, I, something in me was like, I just wanna be happy. Through six months of chemo, Lauren began to prioritize health and nutrition. She decided to eliminate dairy and processed foods from her diet. There was nothing in a supermarket or a bakery that really satisfied my sweet tooth. And so that's when I started to make my own recipes and I just became determined to recreate the classic chocolate chip cookie, but made of more wholesome, real, unprocessed ingredients so that I could feel good. But I brought it to enough dinner parties, to enough friends' homes, and I just saw the reaction over and over again of People saying, Lauren, this is amazing. In 2007, doctors told Lauren the good news. Her cancer was in remission and Lauren was inspired. I took a business writing class and this guy in my class worked in Whole Foods. And so he set up a meeting and I didn't have a website yet. I didn't have a packaged product, but I took the meeting and gave the buyer samples of cookies I baked at home. And he was like, it's delicious. When can you get me cookie dough? It took seven months and a lot of research and development, but Sweet Lauren's was on the rise. So now it's seven months later and what happens? You come up with a business plan, packaging, it's all over your house, I assume. I only get into a couple Whole Foods in the Northeast. I am that person literally with a suitcase and a toaster oven going on the New York City subway. But I am sure that there were a lot of struggles as you look back. I think the biggest obstacle was in the early days. I didn't have enough orders and distribution and retailers um, on board yet to kind of get over the hump and really become profitable. Sweet Lawrence built a loyal following and soon expanded into Target, Publix, and Kroger. Their gluten-free, dairy-free, nut-free, and vegan cookie dough can be eaten raw or baked fresh. When I first launched, it was in a tub and I realized people didn't love that. And what they really wanted was portion control and ease. So now the packaging, you know, looks like this and inside it's pre-portioned so that it's really easy just to have one or two at a time. In 2022, Sweet Lauren sold 100 million cookies. You've been through so much. And so I guess for people watching who are going through something similar, um, who are entrepreneurs or who want to start a business, what would your best advice be? If you're going through a hard time, I really believe if you have a positive attitude and you just keep putting one foot in front of the other every day, you will get through it and you will turn what could be a really negative thing into a better outcome. Now that is one tough cookie. Cheers to health and wellness. Cheers to health and wellness. <laughs> this is my new favorite cookie. So All right. We, sorry, we had friends come over the other day and they didn't know what to bring that Calvin can eat with celiac disease. So they brought over these. I had no idea the backstory behind them. They're delicious. Yeah, I mean, they're delicious. You can eat them cooked. You can eat them raw. They're delicious. They're healthy. And I mean, what a story. Are they doing seasonal flavors? 
Uh, uh, that's funny. You saw the tag. Yeah. They're doing pumpkin spice and what's the other one? Your favorite, Al. Gingerbread. Gingerbread. Oh, I like gingerbread. gingerbread. I like. But I like bravo it. to her. She turned. Absolutely. I mean, let me tell you something. She kicked cancer's butt and now she sold over a million cookies. I you love go, that. Lauren. Makes you right. want to buy more cookies. Yep. That's my excuse. Thank and you. And they're delicious, yeah. so eat them. Thank and you. You're too. kicking cancer's butt to you. Amen. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I am. Working away at it. Look well, good, are. my friend. Love you guys. All right. Up next, speaking of style, in our style file, Halloween costumes, the whole family can rock using the clothes you can actually wear again. <laughs> we'll be right back. Look how cute they are. a real treat in our Halloween style yeah. file. Costumes you can actually wear in your real life using clothes you may already have in your closet. So here to help is fashion expert Katie Sands. Katie, Hi, Katie. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm so excited for this one. All of your styles are always so practical. So this is funny that you're going to do this with Halloween costumes. I know. It was a bit of a trick, but I think we got really good ones. This is going to be the quickest, easiest, and most affordable way to get ready for Halloween this year. And you guys, we still have oh, less than two weeks, yes. but almost God, two weeks. So two weeks. plenty of time. If you let's put, get into it. Let's get right into it. Okay, our first model, model today is actually my sister. Oh. And she is coming out as, can you guess? Andy Anderson from How to Lose a Guy oh, in 10 Oh days. my gosh. Oh. So this is something that you could pull from your own closet if you have a wedding guest dress. This is a perfect gown. This one is from Amazon Fashion. She's wearing her Super Smalls necklace. We love Super Smalls here because that's the famous De Beers necklace in the show. And of course she has her love fern. And if you want to just take this, you know, to real life, maybe to a wedding the following week. Well, weekend, that's true. Grab your clutch, put down oh, your fern, oh, and you're, you're ready to go. go. Look at that. I feel like you have to walk around with an iPad with the, with the movie. So you can like, see her? Yeah. I know. I love that this is an Amazon dress, too. Yeah. Exactly. And an Amazon clutch. So everything you're going to see today is under $60. That's Boom. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. I can't wait Thanks, to see. Sis. Thank you. <laughs> the next one. Okay. Let's get out our next model. I think you two are really going to appreciate this because I think you might have dressed up like this in the past. Uh, <laughs> Hands down, one of my favorite Halloween yes, costumes. This is an iconic pop icon. <laughs> I love it. Pop All right. Icon. This is my very own makeup artist, Lucas Dean, dressed as Marty McFly. Everybody. What did you do? You just jump ship? <laughs> yeah, he just jump strips. So here we have his That's vest great. on, his jean jacket, a pair of Levi's pants, a flannel right <laughs> underneath. I mean, I would wear this out just as is, but yes. if you don't want to be too Marty McFly and you want to go out in your real life, take the vest off. There he goes. Oh, there you go. It's a very oh. interactive segment today, right? Very nice. And he's going to have his sunglasses. Let's see. Let's just do a little wink. There we go. Uh, <laughs> right. He has his watch. Great. Excellent. You can find all these pieces in your closet. I think everyone no, absolutely. Really has them. All right. This next we used to do back in the day. We just grabbed stuff. I know. You this is a sustainable way to do it, right? It's yeah. how we should all be doing it. Well, okay. you've got, uh, we've you got to recognize our next. That's right. We cooked out. us up. This is from the bear. <laughs> this is from the bear. So oh, have, see, when you're together, I get it. That's Bailey funny. and Brianna. So we, we should have, probably disclose that those are our sisters. Yes. That's right. You guys. We were light on staff today. We had to bring them yeah. to some yeah. of our models. Okay, so we have Bailey. He is Carmi. As you can see, we have throw an apron on. Everyone has an apron. Sure. Everyone yes. has a dark pair of jeans, a t-shirt. Of course, he's holding his containers because he is the chef. And then we have our prodigy, Sydney, over here. He doesn't here. even cook. This is so funny. Wow. Neither do you. <laughs> and then 
then Sydney oh, over here in the bandana, which really went famous. And I think the costume designer, Courtney Wheeler, for this wanted to showcase so their differences. Fun. So mm -hmm. we have her clipboard, her bandana, and of course, their famous clogs. So you guys great. look great. No, I get you it. Look great. I get it now. Earlier Brian, with Brianna, I was like, Ronald, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> Any fam. Thank you, guys. We're really lucky to rock our next Thank look. Exactly. So this Trapping was our gym. couple's costume. But our next costume is our family costume. Okay. I hope you guys recognize this. It was one of my favorite shows oh, of the yes. season, Daisy Jones and the Six. Ah, you can do this with any her. family. Today we're kind of Daisy Jones and the Two, but <laughs> it really works. We have my niece and nephew, Jude and Lila, and oh. our models, Justin and Shirley, rocking it out so today cute. as Daisy Jones and Billy Dude. I, I love, love that. that. Well that's done. Yeah. Sense Nicely you know, done. You get rid of the guitar, and all of a sudden it's just an absolutely it's an absolute. And honestly, this would be a really cute holiday card. I feel like you guys should do this. That's yeah, really we can pretend you're a real family and send <laughs> exactly, it to all our exactly. today fans. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. White Lotus is the last one. Oh, huh? yes, the White Lotus. Okay, who didn't love Tanya? Jennifer Coolidge from White Lotus. Is oh, this oh, not this is so cute. unbelievable? Here she is. This is our beautiful Malal Hawa. She is in this floral dress oh, that's actually great. a symbol oh, from wow. the Godfather. If you didn't if you didn't know that oh, already. I didn't realize that. And then you take off her glasses, take <laughs> off her headscarf, and you can wear this to brunch, you can wear this to a bridal shower, or just out to work with your friends. This is so fun. I, I love it. Wow. It is. Cool. It's a great this is a great set. Again, I say you guys need an iPad, though, just to show people yeah, just in just case. To, we can have so Thank you, Katie. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having Thank me you. again. Thank okay. you. We'll this is right so back. fun. <laughs>Okay, tomorrow on the third hour today, we are refreshing your skincare routine with new techniques to try. Paul, oh, coming up on Hoda and Jenna, a mom and two daughters who beat breast cancer together. Mm. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We hope we see you here tomorrow. We do sincerely hope that. <laughs> Have a <laughs> great sincerely? Wednesday. Have a good day. Oh. Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Oh. You deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker. <laughs>
the middle of the month. I need to say, oh, I forgot. I need to say thank you officially and publicly. Yeah, okay. Because you sent this dress to my dressing Doesn't room. Doesn't it look cute on this her, This is guys? a Jenna dress. I walked in my dressing room, and you were on your phone feverishly clicking on things that I need because I've been wearing similar clothes for many, many yes. years. And then a whole bunch of clothes popped up, so I want to say thank you. I've started dressing you. Let me tell you, this girl takes care of me. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> this girl. <laughs> we were texting at 5.30 in the morning. She said, thanks for taking care of me. And I said, I will always. And I will. Wow. Okay. This is, <laughs> we're talking about misplaced emotions. <laughs> <laughs> we're having a lot of misplaced emotions everywhere. That's what's happening here. And then you were trying to set me up and you're doing all these I'm going nice to. Things. I'm going to do all, that if it's Aaron like Andrews all the thinks. sweetest things. Even, even intent is awesome. Forget about what happens. Intent is amazing. When someone intends to help you, that is amazing. Okay. <sighs> um, so y'all, did y'all see that Britney Spears has a new memoir? Yeah. It's coming, coming out, out next week. Mm -hmm. It's called The Woman and Me, and it's out on Tuesday. I have to say, there are few people who the world, who, who, the, who like the country will yeah. universally root for, and Britney is that person. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. I know. We need Kleenex. What is happening? You know what it is? There's so much, we're just gonna say what it yeah. is. There's so much despair yeah. that sometimes small acts of kindness just melt you. Yeah. That's what happens. Small, single acts. Yeah. Thank you. And kindness. it's Thank you. Thanks, Zach. in a world yeah. that feels increasingly dark. Yeah. You just have yeah. to be the light yeah. where you can because yes. there's a helplessness. Yes. And I think something happens because when the world is as it is, and we don't need to describe no. why it is, but I think, and then Congress isn't working and this is not working. Everybody's quick to say, oh, and look, they can't get it together and they can't get it together and look what they're doing. And that's part of yeah. the problem where, you know, they say you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. Yeah. And it's even if you soften your, your language and rhetoric or look for alternatives and solutions, no yes. matter what it is, you know, electing a speaker or trying to find places where people can come together. And, and find the goodness, find the light, yes. give the light yes. where you can. Yeah, and just lighten someone's load because you, you don't, like, we could walk down the street of New York and not know what anyone's carrying, tap them on the shoulder and ask them what that is. And we don't know the, yeah. you know the burdens or how much they internalize what's going on. But I mean, if we're gonna come back to Brittany, which I think we should, yeah. it's like Brittany, who people root for, I feel like, is telling her own story. story. And there's something about that. Like everyone, for her whole life, people have spoken for her. Yes. You know? I mean, literally, is, she yeah. had a conservatorship yeah. as an adult yeah. where she wasn't allowed to yeah. drive. Yeah. She wasn't allowed the freedom to be. So, yeah, I mean, there is something super powerful mm -hmm. about owning your story and putting it mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. because there are people who you may be like, well, why is she like that? Yeah. Why are they like that? And if they own who they are, yeah. if they put out who they are, then there's empathy. You yes. Know? And also, I, I, I think her story, like her story obviously is very touching and she spoke to People Magazine. She did an interview with them, you know, over email. So they sent their responses back and forth and she talked about some of the difficult parts of her life. Mm -hmm. Her book, by the way, is already number one on, yeah, on Amazon. Yeah, on Amazon. It's going to sell. Yeah. But I do think sometimes you don't, people don't, People, some people say, you know, I don't want to tell my story, I'm not. But I do think there's something to it. I think I told you this story, but I was flying, um, I was flying many years ago. I had breast cancer and I felt horrible and I was on a plane to do something for work and I regretted making the trip. It was a mistake. I wasn't ready to fly. I didn't feel good and breast cancer was my secret yeah. because I didn't want to be that girl. I didn't want to be the poor baby kind yeah. of person. So I got on the plane to fly home and I was miserable. I, the doctor told me I should have probably waited, but I went anyway. And the guy next to me said, hey, what are you doing? And started a conversation with me and I was tired and I didn't want to talk. And he said, what is that on your arm? And I said, oh, it's a compression sleeve. He said, well, what's it for? And I said, oh, I, have an op I had an operation. He said, what operation? I said, oh, well, I had a procedure. So the doctor said, when I fly, I should wear it. Mm -hmm. He goes, what procedure? And I go, okay. I said I had breast cancer and a mastectomy, and um, but I hope when you get off the plane, you, there are other things you think of when you yeah. think of me other than that part. 
And he said, let me tell you something. He said, breast cancer is part of you. Just like going to college and getting married and working at NBC. And he goes, I'm going to give you some advice and you can go to sleep. And I said, okay. He said, don't hog your journey. It's not just for you. Ooh. He said, think of how many people you could have helped on the plane ride home. So he said, you can take your stuff and put it deep in your pockets and go to your grave, or you can help somebody. You decide. And I got off the plane and I was like, oh my God. So from that day on, and his, na his name was Ken, I remember, mm -hmm. from the plane, and I said, okay, like, yeah. I'm not a, I'm, I don't need to be defined by something, but it is part of me. Yes, and you can share it because others who feel alone yes. all of a sudden feel less so. Yes, and I think that that's what yeah. we all have, something. And you share what you want and in your own way. Yeah. You don't have to do it loudly. Or loudly. Yeah. yeah, or even to and just a best friend. There is such an um, incredible strength and listening to the stories of those that yeah. have come before. Yeah. You know, I, I, I never, my grandpa fought in World War II. He was the youngest naval aviator. Mm -hmm. He enlisted against his grandparents' wishes, wow. my, my, you know, yeah. his parents' wishes. He lied about his age so that he could go and serve. And he never talked about it because mm. he was one of those right. of that generation that kept those things close. And it wasn't until I interviewed him here for work that he opened up about like the men that he lost oh. that he opened up about what he that he thought about them every single day and that brought us so much closer then we were able to have other conversations when when he lost my grandmother that were really meaningful to me mm -hmm. and to him and i just feel like if you still have those people in your life your grandparents your parents yeah Ask them. Ask them. Yeah. And Steve Leader yeah. has some great oh, questions. I love he has Rabbi a whole Leder. book yeah. about how to talk to people that we love. You know, another celebrity who's sharing a story, and we adore him, and I cannot wait for this documentary, yes. is Tyler Perry. The title is Maxine's Ooh. Baby. Oh my God. The Tyler Perry story. It delves into his upbringing. He had a very difficult, <laughs> excuse me, upbringing. He became one of the most successful filmmakers of a generation. Can we take a look? Yes, please. Yes. Emmett Perry Jr. was his birth name. He changed his name to Tyler Perry because he had an estranged relationship with his dad. I just could not understand how this man could look at me and hate me with such passion. He had some horrific experiences that ultimately led to the characters he created and the imagination that he had. I had all these people tell me what I would never be. Nobody said what I could be. He was resilient. He fought the demons, the dream snatchers, the haters. People saying you're not gonna become, I have to become. And he became. Tyler, I just wanna tell you how blessed I am to have a son like you. <laughs> wow. That okay. is I'm go is it at the theater? Incredible. Where We're going. No, it's on Prime. Okay, fine. We'll go to our couch. November 17th. Okay, that I mean, is appointment. TV viewing. I know bits of his story, yes. which are so beautiful and moving, what he went through. Yes. But and to come out on the other side soft and loving and uh, giving. Oh. Okay, all right. We See? need more Tyler See Perry's in this world. There okay, they are. We're, we're turning the beat around. Okay, all we right. sure are. Coming up next, something new to watch with your boo. Oh my gosh, I love when you speak in rhymes. We got what you're looking for, right? After this. <laughs>
we are back now with the trio of pop culture experts who are on a mission to keep us all entertained. We love them. They are Lauren, Mariah, and Rachel Smith, who host Sirius XM show. It's called The Smith Sisters Live, and they're here to tell us what should be watching. It's a system, it's a segment we call I'm Begging. <laughs> all right, Lauren, let's start with you. What are you begging us to watch? I am begging you to watch House of Villains. It airs Thursdays on E. It Ooh, has villains. the Mount Rushmore of every reality TV villain who has ever made someone cry, who has ever had a viral moment all living in Ooh, a house. Give us you have give us some. Jax Taylor from Vanderpump. Oh, oh is he a villain? Oh. Tiffany Miss New York Pollard, oh. the legend. Johnny Bananas from The Challenge. We have people from 90 Day, from the Bravo universe, everywhere. Is they, Amarosa? Yeah, that's yes. what I was going to yes. ask. Amarosa. Yes. Amarosa is in it. Yes. They all wow. live in a house together. I'm surprised that it has not been leveled yet. Okay. <laughs> they do challenges, eliminations. Oh. They're competing for $200,000 oh. and the title uh, of America's ultimate super villain. Wow. Wow. Um, okay. Okay, Mariah, I'm like, I'm yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have to hear about this music, Mariah. Yes. It kind of went under the radar. Oh my gosh, for good reason. It's Ed Sheeran's Autumn Variations. It's his latest album. It came out last month, and he did it for the fans. It's his second release this year. It's about 14 of his friends. Like, each song represents their autumn. So it's 14 very unique songs that he wants to be a staple in his fans' lives. And when I tell you this album hits in every way, it, does. Does. it hits. you got to listen. Why, did, but why didn't he yeah, do Yeah, because it's, it's his own uh, record label. It's the uh, first time he's done that. He's done no press, no promo. On his tour, he just wrapped up. He's done some of the songs, but it's really just a treat and almost a secret if you know you know yes. No, I, yeah. I, yes. I like the yeah movie. it's very so nice all right rachel what are you begging us to watch? i am begging you to watch the final season of the crown oh, oh we yes. are we're in girl you sold it. I, they're splitting <laughs> it up into two okay. different parts november and december oh. we unfortunately are going to see the death of princess diana oh. we do see her relationship with dodie fayed we are also going to get the intro to kate middleton oh, wow she's coming in what? we're going to see the new era of royals we are going to get coming of age for prince harry prince william it is going to be Amazing. And this is it, right? Oh, this, this is it. This is the end. This is the series the finale. finale. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, now what you guys always come with one thing that the yes. three of y'all love together. What we talk about. Okay. What it is. Okay, we can't we're, we're begging to you. evangelize about the, <laughs> the golden, golden bachelor. bachelor. The golden when the bachelor. Way you yes. Set your eyeballs to see what Jerry is doing on the ABC. Way he's on ABC, and it's only an hour, which is the yes. biggest crime. Will you tell us oh, what it is about? It, it should she be two hours. Her. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes so, it's too long. I hate to say no, that. No, this when I tell you, I could, wa I could watch a live feed of what's happening in this mansion. He is dating around. Everyone who's on the show is over the age of 60 looking for love. It's people who have lost their spouses, people who are divorced, people who are dealing with real life things like their children. It's truly amazing. The love is great. He's fine and he's kissing everyone. But he how is do kissing you explain everyone. this? Because everyone I talk to, yes. doesn't matter what yes. your age is, this is the show they tell you to watch of all of them. What is it? It is the emotion it's, behind yes. it. Yeah. He mm -hmm. is so in love with his family, in love with his daughters. Real. And he, yeah. it's so real yeah. and mm -hmm. you see the real love love happening on stage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It yes. also feels groundbreaking. Yes. yes. Right? It's amazing to see people who have lived life yes. on TV. It's not just like yeah. Yeah. hot tubs. You know what a marriage yes. will be like. Yes. It's like, yes. I know what I want, and I know you're not the love of my life. I'll spend the rest of my life. Y wow. Are y'all into Jerry, too? Yes. yes. Love him. Sure. Come on. <laughs> All right. You can catch the Smith Sisters live weekday mornings on Sirius XM Radio Andy. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Coming up next, how a mom and her two daughters beat breast cancer together, what they're hoping other women will learn from their schedule, from their story after this.
It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so we wanted to share the incredible story of a mom and her two daughters. You're gonna meet this beautiful family in just a moment, but first take a look at how they are showing their pink power. Growing up, Kelly and I played for hours and hours on end. <laughs> yes, and even though there's a five year difference between the two, they're really, really close. She did everything first, so I got to see it. So I was the lucky one in that I got to see things play out and how it works, and then, you know, then it was my turn. And that goes for cancer, too. Kelly, Trina, and their mom, Wanda Miyahara, went through life having no idea that they were all at high risk for breast cancer. We didn't have any family history of breast cancer. I think we had heard of BRCA, um, but didn't really know how that impacted people or it would impact us or our lives. But six months after a clean, routine mammogram, the mom of two knew something was wrong. One morning I was getting dressed, and I, I felt it. I felt something funny and realized that probably wasn't right. At age 42, Trina was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. As a mom, and being there when she was diagnosed, it's a really helpless feeling. What do you do? You want to help your baby all you can. Because of her young age, doctors did genetic testing and found Trina was positive for the BRCA2 gene mutation that increases a woman's risk of breast, ovarian, and other cancers. Her mom and sister immediately got tested too. The three of us were together that day to find out that we too were also BRCA positive. And it sure wakes you up. Just five months after Trina's diagnosis came another blow. I had breast cancer too. At that time, I was 71. It was fine for me. I was more worried about her than me. I mean, I've lived a long time already. While her daughter was going through chemotherapy, Wanda started radiation. Together, they got through their treatments. That's when Kelly decided to have a preventative double mastectomy. I originally planned on waiting for a while because we wanted to have another baby and it wasn't convenient. And I thought, if Trina had a clean mammogram and six months later she had stage two breast cancer and I already know that I'm BRCA2 positive, I've got to take action now. I scheduled it for the first week of January right away. Three days after that, they called and said, you made the right choice because we found cancer. Had I waited for two years, this would be a totally different story. She basically saved her own life. You realize how fortunate you are that we even had the opportunity and the choice yeah. to actually do something preventative because she knew she was BRCA positive. In the span of 18 months, Wanda and her daughters all fought for their lives and became breast cancer survivors. There were many days when I was going through chemo where, you know, it was, it was rough. Having them, my husband, my father, my kids, we have a couch in our bedroom upstairs and I'd be laying in bed, but every time I opened my eyes, there was somebody sitting on that couch. For the Miyaharas, the strength of family conquered all. And now, as we're looking at ourselves as survivors, I feel fortunate that we get to do that together too. Wanda, Trina, Kelly, welcome. First of all, we're so happy you're all here, and we're so happy you all are healthy, and we're so happy that it was all discovered. Trina, I'm just watching you watch your, your own journey, kind of reliving it again. How are you feeling today? We're so thankful that we're here. Yeah. Um, it's amazing to be able to even represent and do this journey together as a family but it's still shocking to watch. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still surprised every time we tell our own story because mm -hmm. it was so surprising having no family history. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Kelly, I think that's the headline is that you had you had no mm -hmm. knowledge mm -mm. before all of this and you basically <laughs> saved each other's mm -hmm. lives yeah. and mm -hmm. other family members too. I know you're making mm -hmm. this into a documentary. Yes. What, what, do you, what is the message? Yeah. You know, I think when we first found out the shock was why don't more people know about mm -hmm. genetic testing or the the ways they can protect themselves and we were shocked so started documenting journey there was a lot of surprises on the way but our message really is that knowledge is powerful and empowering and we're hoping to get our story across so that people maybe can use it to save 
themselves or their own families. Mm -hmm. Wanda, in that piece, it was very clear that um, <laughs> you, you went through a lot of pain, obviously, going through your own cancer diagnosis, but what was infinitely more painful was what was going on with your daughters. <clears throat> exactly. I mean, like I said, I was 71 when I was diagnosed, but having my daughters go through this was a lot, lot harder. What did, but, you, what did you say to her before she went into surgery? Remember? I'll be here. I'll always be here. Yeah, she did. And I know and she's she strong. And uh, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're leading the <laughs> That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you, you do have each other. And I think one of the things that has been mm -hmm. beautiful about mm -hmm. your story is that you were able to inform other family yeah. members, right. Trina, that to ch get tested. Yeah, right. What right. What's happened since yeah, that? Yeah, when we first tested, I tested first after diagnosis and found out that I had the mutation, the BRCA2 mutation. And so then they tested. Mm -hmm. And as much as I didn't want them to have it, um, it's kind of been a blessing in disguise, mm -hmm. and now we get to spread awareness together mm -hmm. as a family and unit. Other family and you let members. other family members yeah. know, yes. right? Yes, right. and we have 11 people tested very soon after, and nine were positive. Nine out of the 11. Yeah. Did, did everyone, I'm curious, because some people are of that mindset of, I don't really want to know. Was everyone, yeah. Yeah. did everyone want to get tested, or did some no. say, no, thank you? No. no. I think that's normal, right? It must right. have been hard to right. say, but if you know, at least you'll have knowledge. Right, because yeah. knowledge is power, mm -hmm. right? And you could do something about it, be proactive about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but she finally got tested. Good. There but, are still a few family members who haven't been tested. Yeah. yeah. That's their choice. That's their yeah. choice. And the important yeah. thing is they know there's a choice. Yeah. yeah. And Kelly, I mean, you know, I, I think so many women can empathize mm -hmm. with what you were going through because mm -hmm. you had a career, you were ha hoping to have another baby, mm -hmm. but you ultimately put your health first mm -hmm. and saved your life. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, we wanted to have another baby, but and I was thinking. Now you have? <laughs> now we have. <laughs> <laughs> so we waited. I'm an older mom now, but it, it all worked out. And yes, I, you have to think about your family when you become a mom. You've got to be there. And what does it take to be there? You got to look out for yourself. So just like your mother did. Yes. Wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. Right. 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 We yes. want to say thank yes. you to you guys for coming. Y'all are a beautiful family, yes. a shining thank example. You. And, and, you and so I much. love that y'all get to be here together. Yes. 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 Thank you for having me. Girls trip. Girls trip. Let's go. All right. Uh, we love y'all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Coming you. up next, author and poet Cleo Wade on the importance of love and compassion for each other and ourselves after this. Wow. Leah Wade has been called Instagram's favorite poet, and it's easy to see why her social media pages are filled with her messages of wisdom, love, and hope. Yeah, Cleo's new book is a collection of prose and poetry called Remember Love, Words for Tender Times. Ooh. Wait, words for, for tender. tender times? By the way, you're speaking to us in the moment that we need to be spoken to in that way. Why is it important, especially now, because the way we speak to one another is evolving and changing in a way we don't like? Well, I think also we're not giving ourselves permission to feel what's going on with ourselves, and that's part of it. Um, I didn't know that when I decided to call this book Words for Tender Times just how tender of a time we would be in, but 
I wanted to use the word tender because I felt like people would let themselves feel tender. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when the world feels overwhelming or all the problems feel so big, we feel like we're not allowed to have mm -hmm. the problems of our own lives. Yeah. Yes. And therefore, Point. we aren't kind to ourselves and we don't love ourselves through our own tough time. So I felt like if I said, oh, a book for a really, really hard day, they'd be like, no, my day's not that hard because my day's not this, right? Right. But I thought any person could say, I feel really tender right now. Um, uh -huh. I feel sensitive, I feel fragile. Uh, and, and that's what I really yeah. hope to give people mm -hmm. permission. I think that that is such Love a smart that. point. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were talking about that very thing this morning, you know, how, mm -hmm. to, how to hold other people's pain while still letting ourselves yeah. feel whatever it is we feel. Not bribe ourselves out of yeah. it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think the fact that you're talking about these love poems, mm -hmm. and they're not maybe in the way Pablo Nerundo wrote yeah, love yeah. poems, they're love for ourselves, for yeah. others, mm -hmm. for friends. What do you hope people get from this, this book? I really just hope people can remember that they are someone they love too. Mm -hmm. I think we know how to give care to our friends or someone in need and we have a hard time putting ourselves on our list and our ability to give to others is heightened when we know how to give to ourselves first mm -hmm. and it's important, you are important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love, I want to hear one of your poems. Do you mind? There's one that you have, I think, yes. called Remember Love, Love, and it has a lot of themes. You, can you read yes. a little to us? Um, this is from Remember Love, and yeah. it's called Everything That's Happened. There are some very large letting goes to do. People, places, honeyed and bitter phases of life. There are some even larger letting goes to do. Anger, tears, parts of yourself that leave with no return. Have a past. Everything that's happened cannot be held mm. today. Ooh. Oh. That last line especially. Oh everything, yeah. everything that's happened cannot, cannot be, be held, held today. today. I, you know, I, one of the things that I love about you um, is that you aren't like a love expert or a no. healing expert. You just give what you can, which is words comfort it through words, but you yeah. do hear from people that ask you all sorts yeah. of advice. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like words help you kind of navigate mm -hmm. that? I think that we can't always control the first thought that comes up about anything, right? Usually that's our pain or our fear, talking or anxiety, but I think words help us kind of move into our second and third thought with a little bit more grace or patience. Mm -hmm. So if I say, oh, I'm so nervous or I'm so freaked out or, or, or the world is ending, I can also say, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay to feel that way. And I think mm -hmm. if you have certain mantras or you, you, know, you aren't giving yourself grace or patience for your past experiences so they're always haunting you, you can say, everything cannot be held today. Mm. Have a past. I love that. Can I ask about your morning routine, like mm. to set I want to know, how do you set your day? Because to venture out in the world, we have to have something. Yeah. So what do you do in the mornings that gets you prepared for your day? Well, you know, I have two yeah. small children, yeah. so yeah. it is a little psycho. Yeah. yeah, good. I'm glad to hear your Same mom. with ours. Nice hearing that. Good. Okay. We, you know, you don't just get to be like, oh, I just do yoga for an hour. Yeah. And totally. Like, yeah. now a three and a half year old yeah. scurries yeah. into my room in the middle of the yeah. night. And, totally. you know, um, but I do always encourage anyone to take, and I try to do this, five minutes to yourself. I think grounding yourself in your own kind of energy every day so that just even if it's like I just took two minutes, I made the coffee as a ritual by myself and no one talked to me. Uh, and so that I can just say like, no matter what comes from me today, it came from me. It didn't start because I got out of bed mm -hmm. reacting to everyone else yeah, in my home. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I think that that's important. One minute, two minutes, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a grand gesture, this way of caring for yourself. It can be a single minute. Right, yeah. just in the shower. Just yes. your yes. time where you can Yes, and intentionalizing the, the space. Yes. Saying, saying, this is my time to myself. Yes. Um, this is a time I'm, I'm giving and being with me. Right, not making a mental list and doing all the yes. things we do in the shower. Yeah. Cleo, yes. your book came right on time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it tonight mm -hmm. instead of looking at Instagram. Yes. I'm going to sleep Maybe with more sh peace. We should say, we should do that. We should make a, a vow that we're not going to be on any social media before bed. And, and we pick up read Cleo's book. Beautiful words yeah. written oh by you. Thank Cleo. you, thank you, Cleo, thank for you so putting out such so goodness. Much. Remember, you can check out Remember Love. Go to today.com slash book. Coming up next, a dish to warm your soul from one of New York top 
Chef's Leah Cohen, right after this. Autumn is the perfect time for a warm and hearty beef stew, and today our chef is putting her own special twist on a classic recipe. Leah Cohen is the owner of Pig and Cow right here in New York City, and she'll be featured as the annual guest chef series from our sponsor, the Lorne Hotels. And for this recipe, you just scan that QR code on the screen. Leah, we're so happy Hi, that you're Leah. here. Thank you Leah, for okay, you're me. headed to my hometown yes. of Austin. Uh -huh. First time, I'm super excited. I'm doing the guest chef series at um, the Lorne Hotels. Hotel. That's a big deal. That's I know. Fun. And I did one um, in Bermuda because they have where, multiple yeah. hotels. So it's amazing. I'm super excited. We want to go to the one in Bermuda yes. one day. One day we're going there. One day <laughs> Next we're going. year. Was it my, awesome? It was amazing. Okay. It was amazing. So we're making a cozy stew. We are. We are doing a Filipino stew called Kare Kare and it's Filipino American History Month. So okay. it's a great dish. Um, okay. We cool. have some beef chuck. Okay. We also, traditionally it's made with oxtails, but mm -hmm. oxtails are a little expensive these yeah. days. Okay. So we're going on a little cheaper route um, salt and then black pepper okay and then we're gonna just sear it really hard nice and brown how long Ooh, listen to that listen how long do you sear it really for depends listen. you just want it brown on both sides okay. so like a dark brown and then are you gonna put it in the oven too or no yes okay. so then we're gonna add all these aromatics okay. like onions you, you want me to add, add this beef stuff. Mm -hmm. and then we have garlic and bay leaves mm -hmm. and essentially we're just going to cook it until it's tender so you okay. can put a lid on it you can pop it in the oven, you can leave it on the stove top, whatever you Either prefer. way. Either way, just cook until it's really nice and tender, about an hour and a half. Okay. Now you're going to make so the special sauce. The sauce. Yeah. yeah, so we're going to take the liquid from there, the braising liquid, and then we're going to strain it, and then we have onions, shrimp paste. I don't know if you are familiar with shrimp paste. It's a very uh, traditional Filipino ingredient. Can you okay. buy it anywhere? Anywhere. Okay. Um, and then, innocent. yes, and then an auto powder. And then the annatto powder gives it a really nice color. And then we have peanut butter. Yes. That. Yes. This is so it's like a peanut sauce. A peanut sauce. Is this honey? Exactly. Oh, no. That is vinegar. Vinegar. And then we have rice powder. And the rice powder helps thicken the sauce. Okay. And, and you this. just whisk. And you just whisk. Bring it up to a boil, down to a simmer, 10 okay. minutes, and you're good. And then the vegetables, because we have to have our veggies. Yeah. And then we have some bok choy I that's already bok choy. Me too. And it's a nice, vibrant green. So we blanch it in boiling water and then put it, um, shock it in ice water. Water. And then we have Japanese eggplant. Yummy. And so we're just going to sear that um, on both sides. Okay. And then we have the final dish over here. Mm. So once that's nice and seared, we side. have the bok choy oh, and the, and the um, Japanese you. eggplant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to eat this with rice. Here, uh, because it gets spicy. So, it's not spicy, but you just want to soak up yeah, all that delicious sauce. And then we have the super tender beef chuck over here. So is it a sweetness or is it a savory? It's what is sweet, it? a little bit of sweetness because mm -hmm. there's sugar in the, the peanut, peanut butter. butter. And then, but mm. it's savory. Mm. And then it has a little funk from the shrimp paste. Mm -hmm. And then the Japanese. But not too funk, I would say. Not too funky, not too funky. And traditionally the shrimp paste is served on the side, but I like to put it in the sauce mm. because I want to force people to eat it because sometimes they can get turned off by something that they don't know. By the way, that's delicious. <laughs> that's Thank you delicious. So much. This is so comforting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And oh then we, um, we actually serve a version of this 
at my restaurant, Pig and Cow on the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. We do a skewered version. So instead of a braised version, we do a grilled skewer version, the same sauce. And then I'm doing a version of this dish. I'm going to actually do it as like a dumpling form mm. at the Lauren Hotel for the guests. In Austin? Restaurant. In Austin, yes. All right. Okay, her tickets are still available if people want to go. Yeah, get there. Left. Yeah. Uh, all my Austin well, friends, congratulations. <laughs> go see Leah. Thank all right. you. To get this recipe, head to today.com slash food. And you can check out Leah on November 9th at the Guest Chef Series at the Lauren at Lady Bird Lake. And my favorite place, Austin, Texas. Enjoy oh, it. Coming up next, she's one of the UK's biggest music stars. And now Birdie is out with a new album, and she's singing it for us. Coming up oh right gosh. after this. The City Music Series on Today is proudly presented to you by City. At the age of 14, Birdie became a breakout star with her cover of the hit song Skinny Love. Now the Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter has racked up more than five billion streams and her songs have been featured in major Hollywood movies. She's a big deal. Birdie's back with new music, <laughs> the release of our fifth studio album called Portraits. Birdie, it's so nice to see you. So we were nice. just asking about you, you growing up. Yeah. And I was imagining your mom as a concert pianist showing you how to play a little <laughs> piano. Yeah. When did you find kind of your own singing style? I think I was always singing yeah. since I was really young. But uh -huh. um, when I was kind of seven or eight I started writing at the piano and ah. I, started, I started playing chords and then discovered I could sing over the top. And so you were writing songs. your own songs at age seven yeah. and eight? Wow. Oh my and gosh. And they were all very sad. Yeah. <laughs> kind of listening like what's wrong with what's, that? What have we done? <laughs> yeah. Really quickly you have to tell us about this performance at the yeah. National Gallery. This was incredible for portraits. Yeah. Yeah the National Gallery were doing it in a, an event oh and they asked God. me to perform and it was kind of perfect obviously because the record's called portraits. That was oh. must was have been so magical. magical. It really was. Or what are you going to sing for us today? I'm going to sing a mm -hmm. song from a new record called Paradise Calling. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Birdie. Take Thank it you away. so much.
got to get to the album. Yes, it's get it. It's called Portraits. It is out now. Now, she's already sold out in New York for concert, but you can check her out in LA at the Velasco Theater next Thursday. Yes, and you'll be are, everywhere, they're, right? They're probably yeah. sold out right now yeah. at this moment, but anyway. Thank you, Bernie. We'll be back Thanks, right Bernie. after this. Our guys, we've got a special show that will help you own your health and live your life to the fullest. Yeah, Maria Shriver sits down with her daughters, Christina and Catherine, to talk about the issues facing women in their 30s. Great conversation. Also, a candid conversation with Naomi Watts about menopause. Yeah, plus Bobby Thomas opens up about the importance of intimacy in her life now and some top docs answer all your health questions. Look at that lineup. How top awesome. Star. It's going to be a great show. We're looking forward to it. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? But it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Anal stuff with a snap. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, 
And I am the president of the corporation here at Dookie Chases. And I'm Edgar Duke Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dookie Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chases as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution, years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African-American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. Well, there were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana, 
Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We it's are great enjoying food. everything. Yeah. Yeah. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase oh, to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the, the service, service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came 
you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner, Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks who are in the North, they still experience poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. 
the dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, Sylvia so, so used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applies a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh-huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Ah, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now this now you're is a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're going person. for. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here but there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activist Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come to the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Oh, oh, pie there. Craig Melvin here, filling in for Al Roker on this episode of Family Style. And today, well, today we're talking, talking all about one of the country's most popular desserts and a holiday staple. We're talking about pie. And as a, a southerner and a pie lover, pecan, pecan here, it's my favorite, not pecan, pecan. So this assignment was almost too good to be true. From our Thanksgiving tables to our 4th of July barbecues to Christmas and the winter holidays, pie is central to so many of our celebrations. Homemade or baked at, at wonderful shops like this one called Michelle's Pies in Connecticut. Americans sure have strong fillings for pie. See what I did there? But how did we become a nation of pie people? Join me as I slice into the significance of this iconic dessert and piece together how and why different pies are so important to communities across this country. Mm. Time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Yes, pecan might be my favorite, but this, this is my second favorite. I'm a huge fan of a good old fashioned sweet potato pie. And I'm not alone. For millions of black Americans, making a sweet potato pie is a meaningful tradition this time of year. And in Minneapolis, one woman stopped selling her highly sought after sweet potato pie and with the help of her family, started giving them away for free. Now, through her nonprofit, she is bringing generations together to bake and then gift her tasty pies. It's a recipe for spreading love and creating meaningful connections. You could say they're baking the world a better place. Here's to the joy of our blackness, our beauty, Ooh, 
our energy, our power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just being able to come together in unity. Onward. 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 That's Rose McGee, the founder of the Sweet Potato Comfort Dog. On a fall morning, a group of women gather at her home just outside Minneapolis. I appreciated young Brittany Wright uh, approaching me and saying, Miss, Miss Rose, you really should teach us young women how to make sweet potato pie. I'll just take a little piece of the shell itself and just slide it in there and that'll pull it right out a lot easier than trying to use a spoon because it's thicker. Gotcha. Passing a tradition from one generation to the next. Mama Rose is really good at bringing people together, making them feel welcome and having a sense of belonging. And so I thought it'd be really cool on my birthday to bring a bunch of women together, sharing experiences, learning how to bake pies, learning something from the African-American tradition. Each attendee will be making three pies to share with their community. One to keep, one to gift to an elder, and one to gift to someone younger than them. Once we got the first batch of sweet potatoes boiling, I started exhaling. When you peel, always go to the tip, and then it just pulls right off. For Rose, sweet potato pie is not just dessert, it's a catalyst for connection, one that she considers sacred. It seems like it's all about the pie, but really the pie just happens to be the sweet spot that brings people together. I used to sell the pies years ago. No idea that one day I would feel compelled to give them away. Not to sell them, but to give them away. I started Sweet Potato Comfort Pie in 2014, not really realizing that that's what I was doing after the killing of young Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And I was sitting there watching television like felt this calling. I obeyed that calling and made about 30 pies, packed them in my car and my son Adam drove down with me. But what I discovered was people wanted to be heard and listened to. They wanted to feel that um, they were being respected. So I took that to heart and brought it back home. Back in Minneapolis, when George Floyd was killed, Rose stayed up all night baking pies to take to the memorial site to help her own community heal. And I didn't know what to do except make some pies. And that's why I know it's, it's, it's not just about me. It's bigger than that. Is anybody really gonna respond to that? And people do. The organization's mission is to strengthen and cultivate relationships with the solidarity and story sharing that is part of making and receiving the pie. I'm not trying to over-emotionalize anything, <laughs> but I will say, it's something when people allow you to feel purpose mm -hmm. and allow you to see That's beauty it. within yourself. The sweet potato pie we know today was inspired from West African cuisine and dates back centuries. To get to the root of its origins, we must first talk about yams. I'm Rossi Nastapulo. I'm the author of Sweet Land of Liberty, A History of America and 11 Pies. So a yam is an old world crop and a sweet potato is a new world crop. And so yams are really an important part of the West African diet. Whereas sweet potatoes, they are grown kind of on this side of the world. In the United States, sweet potatoes grew abundantly in the South. Enslaved black Americans tended to these crops and cooked with them, contributing to many of the sweet potato recipes we know today. However, credit to black chefs and cooks didn't come until the late 1800s. There was Melinda Russell's A Domestic Cookbook and then Abby Fisher's What Mrs. Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking. And so these are two black authored cookbooks that included recipes for sweet potato pie and really were an opportunity for these black chefs and cooks to reclaim their knowledge and have the credit given to them. When emancipation comes, they continue to make sweet potato pie and this time they're making it for themselves, their families and their communities. So you're just gonna put in a third of the way. For those close to the sweet potato comfort pie, it's what's in the batter that really truly matters. Antoinette Pearson Edinger is a pastry chef and helps manage the kitchen at sweet potato comfort pie gatherings. 
I was at the first meeting in here in Rose's living room. When I was growing up, if there were some trauma in a family or some celebration in a family, you went down the street with the pies in your hand to present to the family that was either in need or is celebrating and communicate with the folks that are there. She, oh, the pies are ready. <laughs> Today, back in Rose's kitchen is one of those celebrations in honor of Brittany's birthday. What I appreciate about this, we have been in responsive mode. We try to respond to these crises that happen across the country and locally. So to do something more celebratory is very uplifting and very inspiring for us all. It's a sisterhood. Through these pies, through Mama Rose, we're able to celebrate each other, empower each other, encourage each other, and we're doing it in a way through unity. The future of Sweet Potato Comfort Pie, I believe, is a good one. Everybody has this need of wanting to connect, and when you're baking pie, you just, you're gonna connect. The heart of the comfort pie connection is love and a commitment to greater good. And of course, always keeping their eyes on the pie. When in doubt, bring a bunch of black women into the kitchen and we'll figure it out. Coming up, a family in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, whose ancestors helped invent a sticky dessert that's still being served up today. And welcome back to Family Style. And another pie rich with history and a little sugar as well. Some say the origin of this pie known as shoe fly can be traced back to a cake, specifically the Centennial Cake. It first appeared in Philadelphia circa 1876, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And while the exact origins of the shoe fly pie are lost to time, no matter how you slice it, it is a true American original. In the heart of Pennsylvania's bucolic Amish country lies a town with a name that sounds like a familiar adage. Burton Hand is nestled in Lancaster County. A lot of farming, a lot of agriculture, and a lot of really good, hardworking people. It just has a peaceful and calm feeling. It just envelops you. Bird in Hand isn't just the name of this small village, it's also the namesake of a family-owned corporation that runs a group of lodges, a campground, and eateries. John Smucker runs the business. Under his wings, the Bird in Hand Bakery and Cafe, best known for its shoe fly pie. Raised Mennonite, John and his wife Myrna have deep roots in this neck of the woods. 
My family's story in Pennsylvania begins in 1752 when my immigrant ancestor Christian Schmucker uh, emigrated from Switzerland and Germany, came to America, established a farm homestead here in Lancaster County. And I'm the eighth generation. Pennsylvania Dutch refers to immigrants who came to the U.S. from German-speaking countries in the 18th and 19th centuries, mainly to escape religious persecution in Europe. By the late 1700s, it's estimated that these immigrants accounted for more than a third of Pennsylvania's population. Well, that'd be the new farmers. He's out there doing it. John's ancestors, along with countless others, brought with them new types of cuisine and helped invent that sticky dessert that's famous in this region, shoe fly pie. The origins of shoe fly pie are a little bit murky. One historian traces it back to Centennial Cake, which was made in the 1800s as a celebration of Pennsylvania's centennial. Shoe fly pie, an apple pan, and it makes your eyes light up. And so that was a crustless version that then once it becomes placed in a crust to become more easily transportable, that turns into shoe fly pie. The Smucker family has been serving up their family's shoe fly pie to the public for more than 50 years. And they've been baking it for much longer. But what exactly is shoe fly pie? I'd start with delicious. The topping is different, so it's not so sweet pecan pie with no pecans. <laughs> shoe fly pie is a type of molasses pie. It's really a product of Pennsylvania Dutch cuisine, and it's distinguished by its inclusion of streusel, which is very classic to those types of European cuisines. On the frontier, they had a limited amount of ingredients, a limited amount of resources, and so one of the products that they would have had was molasses, and molasses was stable. Most shoe fly pies include molasses. The smuckers, however, do things a little differently. We do not use a molasses product for our shoe fly pie. We gravitate towards a light table syrup. Another unique feature of shoe fly pie, the traditional ingredients don't require refrigeration, making it a convenient treat for the many Amish residents in this part of the country. That's Anna Mary Smucker, or to those who knew and loved her, Grussy. Uh, my grandmother, Anna Mary Smucker, was the one who I would say was the ultimate pie baker in our family. I'm sure she picked up recipes from her mother who picked them up from her mother before that. In a 1938 edition of National Geographic on the Pennsylvania Dutch, Grussy was even featured with four of her kids, including John's dad and a shoe fly pie. John comes from a long line of bakers, influenced by his grandparents and his parents. My mother was a pie baker, so she was a busy cook and a housekeeper. And my father was out on the farm and doing different businesses, and so she uh, was busy in the kitchen taking care of the family. In 1970, John's father, Paul, opened the family's first restaurant. There, they started serving the family's signature pie to locals and tourists. In the mid-80s, John opened another nest for foodies, Bird in Hand Bakery and Cafe, just to keep up with the soaring demand for their baked goods. Pumpkin pie, shoe fly pie, and cherry crumb pie. Ah, uh, I just love pies. The pies here are all made from scratch, including the ooey gooey wet bottom shoe fly, using Smucker's recipe that's been passed down for generations. And apparently, this pie isn't just for dessert, I have it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, not necessarily every day. What's delicious on the plate first needs to take shape. And we like our shoe fly pies to be sweet and smooth. There are two main components, the goo and the crumbs. The wet filling is made with hot water, light table syrup, light brown sugar, baking soda, and eggs. It's stirred with a canoe paddle-sized kitchen tool. So to us, the goo is one of the most important features of the pies. That filling is poured into a homemade pie crust. The pie's signature crumb topping is made with pastry flour, light brown sugar, cinnamon, salt, and shortening, which is combined in a large mixer. Crumbs go on top, and then this goo is down below in a layer that's about a half an inch thick. When we bake it, the crumbs work down through into the pie a bit and um, help to create what I call that middle layer. 
Back when Grussy made her pies, she didn't shoo the grandkids away. She just let us dig in. After about an hour in the oven, the pies are cool, covered, and carried right from the kitchen to the bakery. While visitors to this bakery savor unforgettable flavors and a pinch of the past, for John and his family, the pies are symbolic of so much more. My grandmother would always say, give good measure. She was a very hospitable person. I see pies as part of hospitality. These folks are proudly carrying on a unique Pennsylvania Dutch tradition here in the land known as Bird and Hand. Coming up, a New York City baker's quest to bring back a long lost Christmas time pie. Pie today, gone tomorrow. That's what, that's what seemed to be the fate of a beloved bygone Christmas time pie. It was popular for, well, a New York minute. Well, I guess a few decades to be exact. But today, one bakery in New York City is bringing back this long forgotten chestnut rum and cherry creation called Nestle Road. It's not your traditional a pumpkin, apple, or, or blueberry dessert, but it is a treat that many older New Yorkers probably remember from childhood. Served up with a slice of nostalgia and a memory of decadent New York. Our motto at PD's is damn fine pie for damn fine people <laughs> because we're just so proud to be a New York business. Pie has been a part of New York's culinary history the entire time and we just wanted to elevate it the best we could. I'm Petra Paredes and I am the owner and head baker of PD's Pie Company. PD's Pie, named after Petra's childhood nickname, has been serving up damn fine pie since opening in New York City in 2014. We opened up the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. We sold like 100 pies. And then the next year, we sold 1,000 pies. This past Thanksgiving, nearly a decade after opening, Petey's sold 10,000 pies. The big holiday rush isn't new to Petra. She grew up pulling all-nighters before Thanksgiving in the name of pie. Pie has been part of my life since I was born. I was born into my parents' bakery. <laughs> they have a bakery called Mom's Apple Pie Company in Virginia. And I always spent my Thanksgivings working at their shop. 
They are still in business and they still do tremendous Thanksgiving business. Petra inherited a love of baking from her dad. My dad is really obsessive about quality of ingredients and that's something that I have learned from him to just be really focused on flavor and on like the texture and balance in a pie. Petra left the family pie business and moved to New York City to pursue a career in teaching. It was at the end of my first year of teaching that I met my husband, Robert. Seemingly, against all odds, it was poker that brought Petra back to pie. He, interestingly enough, was playing poker <laughs> professionally at the time. He wanted a place to invest his poker money. <laughs> and so I sort of half-jokingly asked him if he wanted to open a pie bakery with me. Robert didn't call her bluff. And he said yes. We'd been dating a few weeks <laughs> at the time. <laughs> and we spent the next three years planning it. Petey's menu offers the classics like apple, banana cream, key lime, and also a beloved bygone pie. The couple's love of culinary history led to Nesselrode's discovery and return. One of the things that Robert and I used to do as we were planning our business was we would look at the New York Public Library's menu database, which is really fun. And one pie that we kept seeing over and over that we had never heard of and never tried and weren't sure how to pronounce <laughs> was Nestle Road Pie. It was on a lot of sort of mid-century menus from the 1940s through the 1960s. This elusive pie piqued Petra's interest. Stumbling across Nestle Road on these old menus was sort of like uh, discovering a fossil or something. Petra saw this as a chance to bring back a piece of decadent New York. Her curiosity inspired a sweet revival. Nestle Road wasn't always a pie. It actually started as a frozen custard dessert in sort of the Victorian ages. It's a very decadent thing to have a frozen dessert before, you know, refrigeration was widely available. It was like the most fancy dessert you could imagine. First off, it was named after a Russian diplomat by his private French chef. Not to mention its luxurious ingredients of chestnuts and liqueur. Years later, the Big Apple heavily influenced the evolution of this decadent dessert. It went from a pudding mold to a pie crust. It sort of transformed in New York City in around the 1940s by this woman named Hortense Spire. Baking the pies from her Upper West Side brownstone, the pie quickly gained popularity. She made pies for like all of the fancy New York City restaurants, all the steakhouses and all the fancy fish seafood restaurants. The pie was a mid-century marvel. As demand grew and the pie became a New York City diner and sweet shop staple, many renditions no longer included chestnuts. By the mid-60s, it all but faded into oblivion. Nestle Road is one of Petey's holiday season offerings, but the supply is limited. Because it's so labor intensive, we can only make 80 over the course of the week. In creating her Nestle Road pie recipe, Petra sought to honor the origins of the dessert. I wanted to bring that chestnut uh, part of the flavor profile and bring it sort of front and center. My recipe is almost sort of a mashup of the sort of Hortense Spire 1940s era and the New York Diner 1960s era. All of Petey's pies start with the same crust. My crust is based on my dad's recipe. It pushes the limits with one ingredient. My crust recipe has like a eight to nine ratio of butter to flour, which is really high. Next up, preparing the chestnuts for roasting. I puree the chestnuts with sugar and with rum, and that is sort of the base note flavor of the whole pie. The filling's light, delicate texture is achieved using gelatin. It's sort of like a, a chiffon or like a fluffy custard kind of pie. The filling is then chilled. We did like a Swiss meringue. The meringue is folded into the filling. Time to top with ganache. And of course, the final step, a cherry on top. There actually 
sour cherries. When I hear that somebody um, who hasn't tried Nestle Road Pie since they since the 1960s tried my Nestle Road Pie and loved it and just got a sense of nostalgia out of it, it really sort of brings a, a whole other layer of meaning into, into the work that I do. Outside of the bakery, Petra and Robert are raising three little pie people with a fourth on the way. My kids are really into pie. They really love to eat pies. As for if their kids will share a slice of the shop one day. Who knows if they'll want to continue the pie business. I look forward to passing on everything that I know, just like my parents did, and, um, and seeing if they're interested. For most Americans, it seems that there's always room for pie, and the significance of that slice can adapt to circumstances, places, and people. Through pie, it seems we can more deeply understand not just our country's history, but our own sweetened memories. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the strong environment of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you gotta think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy and you can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. 
and one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. <laughs> Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pans and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for an autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh-huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home that's they're, they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel, oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people, we were here 20 years, it's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations, grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking, and I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all-jumbo lump. Growing up, did you, did you think you were going to end up here, you were going to be doing this? No, <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from, and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So. The pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started in 79, a uh, week before my son was born. 
I started at 14 years old and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. It's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You, 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 you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> it's just a few of them, you know? Just a few. While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's, it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's Crab Cake recipe? He doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up salty. Saltines. Broken salty, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the Mine big is. ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. Oh, look at this. Oh, boy. Oh, it was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks, 
Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well. He grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman and my grand, great-grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught processed and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There's more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. How did biting today? This morning it did pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and let nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, now I'll be 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs. And it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it would be no chance no more black watermen. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that 
certain taste to them. And, and, and it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up-and-coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. So I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a uh, family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in that mass, you know, cars double park up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef 
stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, the people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know. Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking craft. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. Were you able to add a little? Bit? Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, "What did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this?" And I would tell him. I said, "You don't have to follow to the letter. You know, put your own spin." And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right. Patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, it shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just got to see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> This sauce in particular is our, our crab sauce mix. Oh. So we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. I don't want to put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's, she's stay <laughs> by me. I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about you know when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular? The recipe, the most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on on the go. Uh -huh. You know, throwing your hand. Kind and of street food. Really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. You know, <laughs> yeah, because that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it's not right, tasty, right, exactly. right. uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a, a quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit in the middle. Is that too yeah. much? Yeah, we want to take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we want to put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. That's right, perfect, sorry. perfect. 
And we're gonna just, literally fold them up envelope style. What, what is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, and Lawrence, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> wow! It's a natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're going to get get the deep fryer up here and fry these yeah. bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You have to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and, and how does Baltimore uh, kind of play into that? Pretty much my, my story, and I think that connects very well to our Baltimore, you know, because, you know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that. And it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore. And they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and so I'm around the edges and then things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't uh -huh. fry on one particular side too much. And just want to even fry. Ooh. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So. Yeah. so I'm gonna drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's Try the piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Egg roll. Here we go. Wow. Chef Hawk, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake, tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true. Food tastes better when you eat it with family. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making sure we're enjoying these for years to come. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We call this right here, the avocado tunnel of love. <laughs> In the past 20 years, believe it or not, avocado consumption has tripled in the United States. Today, the average American eats eight pounds of these babies every year. I'm at Rancho Vasquez, one of the oldest avocado orchards in the country. Here, the Vasquez family grows several different varieties. Let's avocado check it out. Oh, welcome to Rancho Vasquez. Art? Yes, nice Art. to meet you. How's it going, sir? Damien Vasquez. Damien, nice welcome to see to the you range. guys. Army veteran Art Vasquez has turned his love for avocados into a true family obsession. Four generations live together on this scenic ranch. Many of them work in the orchard and help run the business. I've never been to an avocado farm. Wow. So, this will be gonna, a lot of fun. You guys going to give me a tour? Absolutely. All right, let's go. Art's grandfather, Refufio Morones, 
moved to the U.S. from Mexico in the 1920s. He picked avocados and citrus fruit on several farms, but always dreamed of having his own orchard. When Art was seven, the family purchasing their first acre of this ranch. And that's when my grandfather, Rufio, would start teaching me how to take care of the trees. That's when I, I really started loving picking. My brother and I would pick the avocados, take the avocados down to the town, knocking on doors, selling the avocados. Art put his passion for produce on hold to pursue a career in the auto parts industry. In 2002, he was able to buy the entire property, which was destined to be raised for new houses. We've taken it from 250 trees all the way up to 3,750 trees. This is something, a sustainable legacy that I can leave here and teach my children, grandkids, and the family how to work the earth, how to grow things organically. Art had also saved a piece of Golden State history. Avocados are native to Mexico, but some of the first avocado trees in the U.S. were planted in L.A. County in the mid-1800s. Henry Dalton, a wealthy trader who owned ranches in California, fell in love with the fruit during trips to Central America. In 1848, Henry planted the first avocado tree in Azusa. So when he moved to Los Angeles and he took over and bought Rancho Azusa, he knew there was fresh water coming from the Azusa Canyon. And so because of having the fresh water source and the awesome soil, he knew avocados would be great here. During a tour of the ranch, I got to see a living part of that history. What makes it special is one of the first planted avocado trees in the Western United States. This puppy is one of a kind. It's like us, Al. It's one of a kind, okay. <laughs> and it's still producing fruit? It's still producing fruit. It produces anywhere between 500 to six, 700 pounds of fruit a year. Experts estimate this tree is more than 100 years old. It produces a type of avocado known as the fuerte, in Spanish meaning strong. It was the first avocado variety to thrive in the United States because it can withstand cooler temperatures. But in the 1920s, a new variety emerged in SoCal that would ultimately dominate the world market. A guy by the name of Rudolf Haas, he was actually a postal carrier, but his hobby was growing. So he had an orchard at his house about 20 miles from here, La Habra Heights. The Haas avocado was a total accident. An amateur farmer, Rudolph had purchased some mystery avocado seeds. When the tree matured, he was surprised by the dark, bumpy fruit it produced. And that really took off commercially because it has a thicker skin. So for shipping purposes, and it's an amazing tasting fruit. The Fuerte and many other avocados stay green when mature, but the skin on a Haas turns black when ripe, hiding any bruises. It didn't take off right away among consumers in the U.S., so it took a few marketing campaigns for Americans to embrace this creamy variety of the fruit. This fourth, put a little green in your red, white, and blue. Today, 80% of avocados grown worldwide are Haas. Now here, this is one of the first Haas trees commercially ever planted. We've got two Haas trees right here. Until the 90s, the majority of avocados consumed in the country were grown in California and weren't available year round. But all that changed in 1994. President Clinton made NAFTA the law today, making the United States to Canada and Mexico in one large trading bloc. When NAFTA passed, avocados from Mexico became available everywhere, and folks could enjoy them anytime. Today, even named avocado toast a top trend of the 2010s. Avocado toast. I'm not sure how this happened, but there came a time in the past 10 years when people began to realize that their lives were not complete without it. Thanks to clever campaigns, new diet trends, and an abundant supply, avocado consumption has boomed in the last two decades, growing into a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, 90% of those avocados come from Mexico. However, this has led to major environmental impacts like deforestation. Rancho Vasquez wants to combat the negative effects of monoculture farming. As an organic orchard, they follow strict guidelines to help protect the land. How have the trees and what you grow 
tried to lessen the impact on the environment. We pick the weeds by hand. Are we weedy? Because it's all organic. Yeah. So we don't ever spray any weed killer or anything like that. The deer come and eat all the lower leaves and skirt the trees for us. Ah. And they turn that into natural manure. Now, when it comes to picking, avocados require a gentle touch. So we still do it the same high-tech way they did it 100 years ago. Wow. You and this is my grandfather's pole? pole right here. Really? Yeah, this is one of the old school ones. So you can pick any of these you want. Okay. So yeah, you just slide it right up till the avocado goes in the basket, and then you pull on the rope. There you go, you're almost there. Pretty different, you're doing pretty darn yeah. good, you know? A little bit further, and then pull the rope. There you there go, you is. got it. Good job. <laughs> He's ready to catch. Ta-da! <laughs> there you go. My That's first a nice avocado. One too. It's going to take a week to a week and a half right now to ripen and let it get soft. How about going and tasting some? Yes, sir. We picked some about a week or so, so they'd be perfect for you. All right, let's do it. Believe it or not, there are more than 400 varieties of avocados. Rancho Vasquez in Azusa, California sells six. The Fuerte, Hass, Lamb Hass, Reed, Pinkerton, and Gem. Each has a different shape, taste, and growing season. I've never seen such a, like, a round avocado. The ranch's avocados are prized by chefs and customers for their high oil content. That comes from the area's climate, nutrient-rich mountain soil, and secret farming techniques that have been passed down for generations. The higher the oil content, the better the tasting fruit is. Mm. And then the longer it'll stay green. You can taste and see the difference with their organic hash. It just keeps it well, really You can literally fresh. see the oil coming out of it. Yeah. So if you want to try just a little chunk, we'll give you a little chunk. Oh, that's great. Next up, the family favorite. Fuerte. Oh, a real, really a different flavor. Absolutely, absolutely. There's almost, it's almost like a saltiness and a creaminess in there. Aside from his wife's guac, Art's favorite way to eat avos is actually with honey. Ooh. It's called avocado dulce, which is avocado candy. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Isn't it great? I would have never thought of that. Guys, this is just amazing. What does it mean for both of you to to be owners of this of this legacy. This is a legacy I do want to leave. My family, my grandkids, Damien, and this will be around for, I'm hoping and praying, for at least another 100 years, you know? And what does it mean for you, Damien? Oh, it's like he said, just a place where history can keep going. Because the trees were here before us, and they're gonna be here after us, so we're just kind of stewards of the land in the meantime. Let's share a little of this guacamole. Yes, sir. Yep. Let the chips fall where they may, as long as they've got guacamole on them.
Avila's El Ranchito is a Southern California staple that's been in business for more than half a century. They've got 13 locations and counting of this family-run chain, but no two restaurants are exactly the same. Every Avila's owner puts their own spin on the family's traditional Mexican recipes. But here at the Seal Beach Outpost, they claim to have the best guacamole. So I've come to learn their secrets. It's time to guac and roll. Hey there, wow, got a lot of folks here. The aunts, uncles, siblings, and cousins behind Avila's El Ranchito really treat their guests like family. This location is run by Elise Avila Smith, a third generation restaurateur. She credits the family's success to her grandma Margarita's hospitality. You know, she just focused on really what we focus on good, fresh food. Salvador and Margarita, or Mama Avila, immigrated from Mexico to the U.S. in 1958. How did they get into the restaurant business? My father had an opportunity to buy a restaurant and talked to my mother and decided, you know, this is a great opportunity. Salvador using his life savings to purchase the old restaurant property in Huntington Park. He turned to his six kids, including Elise's dad, Victor, for support. We would go after school and help them do whatever needed to be done. And my father was pretty much during the day taking care of the whole restaurant, and my mother was in the kitchen. So she was in the only one in the kitchen. And then, Grandpa Poldo was well, washing yeah. dishes. Mama's traditional recipes have been passed down through many generations. These have come from way, way back in Mexico. When it first opened in 1966, Avila's was the only Mexican restaurant in the mostly white neighborhood. Many customers had no interest in Mama's traditional dishes, so she developed a strategy to draw people in. It seemed like natural for my mother to offer the people whatever they wanted. So mm. it was more like a home. If they didn't have it on the menu, then my mother would go in the kitchen and make it anyway. Over the next three decades, the Avila siblings opened six new restaurants in Southern California. This expansion wasn't a coincidence. Americans at the same time were falling in love with Mexican food. In the early 80s, there were an estimated 2,500 Mexican restaurants in the U.S. Today, there are more than 60,000. I was busting tables here as a child. <laughs> Elise witnessed that growth as a kid, watching her dad expand the family business. So I grew up doing homework in a booth. On top of that, I grew up with my grandparents living one street over from me. So I grew up cooking with her for years and years. After college, Elise tried working in other fields, but she was always drawn back to the restaurants. I'd be working by day, you know, I worked for a magazine. And then my brother opened his first restaurant and I ended up serving tables at night. So no matter what I did, I kept ending up back in this business and I loved it. I realized that this was my passion, it's in my blood. How do you qualify to open up a, an abla? Well, it's process, let me tell you. <laughs> Is it really? I had to work every position in the restaurant. So I washed dishes, I worked in the kitchen for a few years, but I've done it all. After proving herself for a decade, Elise opened her own Avila's in 2015. When I first opened my restaurant, I worked for several months from about six in the morning till midnight. And finally, I remember my dad and my brother came in for an intervention and said, you need to go home. You gotta sleep. <laughs> you gotta sleep. So I went home and they ran my restaurant for the night. And I knew with my dad and my brother here, there was nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Every Avila's restaurant is unique, reflecting the family member who owns it and the location. They have different decor and specialty menu items. Elise puts her own spin on the brand by offering an extensive tequila cocktail menu. Dad, I'm gonna make you a drink right now. Make it strong. <laughs> Salute, mija. Mm. But there are several dishes you're gonna find at every location. Avocados are crucial to many of the family recipes, including the signature guacamole and their beloved chicken soup. Tell me right. about Mama Avila's soup. That soup that feels like home to me, but it is a chicken breast and rice soup. We make it from scratch every morning, including the broth. We put fresh avocado, cilantro, onion, and tomato in it. And people go, and the first thing they do when they get off the plane is go to have some chicken soup. You mentioned avocado goes into the soup. Tell me about the importance of avocado. It's part of our culture. Bottom line is nobody wants to eat Mexican food without avocado and some guacamole. <laughs> so I'm curious, first you, Victor, what's the secret to a good guacamole? You have to make it, you know, almost really as on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. 
It needs to be fresh. It needs to be well seasoned. And a little bit of love. I like to think I make a good guac, but I, <laughs> I'm sure I can learn from the best. So how about showing me how you guys do guac? Before making some guac, I enjoyed a cucumber margarita and got a taste of Mama's famous soup. That's great. I would never think about avocado in chicken soup. Oh my God. I can't take credit for that one, Al. That's all grandma. <laughs> all right, you ready to make some guacamole? You bet. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna dump some fresh garlic in here. Okay. This is a traditional mocha hete. From there, you're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt Just on top. Just a little bit of salt. Just a little bit of love. And then you're gonna use the top to go ahead and grind it in there. A mocha hete, a Mexican mortar and pestle, is made from volcanic rock. And it's the family secret to great guac. The rough surfaces help crush the ingredients, releasing their natural oils better than chopping them up with a knife. And we're gonna get in some fresh avocado. All right. And then you go ahead and mix that together. And now you gotta be gentle with the oh, avocado soft. With, with some be love. Gentle, gentle. In go diced onions, lots of cilantro, and a good squeeze of lime juice. Keep on mixing there, and you got yourself some good, fresh guacamole. I'm gonna dig in here with you too, Al. Mm. Oh yeah. You make good guacamole, Al. I've learned from the best. Elise, to be part of something like this, what, what does it mean? Honestly, I feel compelled to keep these beautiful recipes that are from, gosh, my great-great-grandparents running so that everyone that comes to our restaurant is able to taste them and to sit at our table and feel like family and just be a part of ours. Cheers. How does a ceviche bar a little different from a, a sushi bar? It's like a sushi bar, but more Mexican. Uh-huh. <laughs> this lively food court is home to several family-owned hidden gems. In fact, here you'll find Holbush, a modern eatery renowned for its sustainable seafood. The chef behind this vibrant menu pairs flavors from his childhood in Mexico with the freshest of California fare. Gilberto Satina never thought he would dedicate his life to cooking but his summers spent on the Yucatan Peninsula would later inspire a bold move. Since I was a teenager, growing up in a coastal region, I would go diving with my cousins. We would dive down for octopus, uh, we'd get lobsters, we'd get sea snails, and then he would take that back and cook it. And that was one of the first times that I felt a direct connection to food because even back then, there was a disconnect, you right. know? Food came from the supermarket. And it was the first time I saw something that was like directly from the sea and you can cook it and eat it right away. So that kind of blew my mind. Gilberto immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. His father, Gilberto Sr., a former civil engineer, worked various restaurant jobs to support the family. How did your family transition from that kind of grassroots sort of food service to right. a real formal restaurant? It, it really was through the help of the nonprofit that, you know, operates Mercado La Paloma. This bustling market 
is run by Esperanza, or HOPE, a nonprofit dedicated to revitalizing South Los Angeles and helping first-time business owners. They gave us small business training, basic you know, restaurant health department training. They co-signed loans so my dad could purchase the equipment. It was my dad's dream to have a restaurant that represented our Mexican food, the food of the Yucatan, which is very distinct from other regions of Mexico. In 2001, Gilberto Sr. opened the family's first restaurant, Chichen Itza. The menu featuring traditional dishes like conchinita pibil, salbutes, and panuchos. Lo empezamos la mamá de Gilberto y yo, o sea, mi esposa y yo. El, al principio éramos dos personas nada más. They needed help, but Gilberto was reluctant to join the family business. I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to be in the kitchen because I, I grew up in a household where we always, you know, cooking was always used to make ends meet, like a lot of, you know, immigrant families. So when we opened the restaurant and my dad asked me to come along and help him out for six months, I was front of the house. Slowly I just discovered the cooking and that I enjoyed it and, you know, started learning from my dad. Even without formal training, Gilberto quickly learning the ropes, becoming a savvy businessman. Ten years in, Chichen Itza was thriving with dozens of employees. They even released a cookbook. Con el paso de los años, finalmente empezó a sentir la misma pasión que yo tenía por el negocio. After taking over at Chichen Itza, Gilberto was ready for a new challenge, one inspired by those summer boat trips in Mexico. Where does the name Holbox come from? So Holbox is a place. It's an island off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. He wanted to bring tropical, fresh from the sea vibes, along with an elevated experience, to diners in South Los Angeles. When Holbosch opened in the same market, it changed many perceptions of what Mexican food could be. We go outside of the realm of Yucatan and we do food from all different coastal regions of Mexico. Gilberto's fusion dishes allow the freshest fish to shine. Menu staples include seasonal ceviches and an octopus taco. His innovative cooking has wowed locals and critics alike. How does it feel to be nominated for a James Beard Award for this? Mm. After the shock, I think the first thing that I felt was extreme pride in my team. To a certain level, I guess it feels a little bit like validation because we're doing something slightly outside of the box. You look across Mexican cuisine and, and one of the commonalities is the avocado. Why does the avocado work so well across cuisines in Mexico, but especially your cuisine? The pairing of avocado goes extremely well with raw seafood preparations like ceviches and cocteles, and they're very bright, light, and acidic. I think avocado is the perfect complement because it gives it a little bit, you know, creamy richness. That delicate balance is best represented in the shrimp and scallop aguachiles. And I couldn't wait to try making it. So agua chile is super simple. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, we're gonna make a marinade that's gonna cook or denature our scallops, right? So we're just gonna take some, some cilantro. Uh -huh. Next up, the chili. Serrano peppers bring the heat. Persian cucumbers cool it down. There's a pinch of salt, ice to prevent oxidation, and a squeeze of lime juice. Then the marinade blends for just about a minute. Now, we're just gonna take a bowl. Go ahead and put a couple of uh, spoonfuls of these beautiful Baja California Bay scallops. Ooh, look at those. Now, we're gonna pour the marinade and hold on to the spoon for a stirring. Perfect. That's about right. We wanna let that marinate for at least five minutes. Gilberto takes his agua chile to the next level with an avocado rose. After pitting and peeling, it was time to get slicing. Your knife can be straight because your avocado is at an angle, and we're pull oh. cutting. You're just gonna do this, Al. Look. Okay. The key to a great rose? Super thin slices. We're hiring, you know. <laughs> okay. Now the next step. Hands, right? This we're gonna do this this motion. We're gonna fan out the okay. avocado, okay. right? So you see that? Oh wow. Go. Looking good there. I think that's uh, good enough to roll. You're gonna start at the tip right here, uh -huh. and you just roll this one like that. You see how that's 
forming a really big flower? Yes. This is a pretty advanced skill, yeah. but I think it's one worth practicing. Oh, yeah. And it's a nice party trick, you know? Sure. Impress your friends. Yeah. So, which one should we use? I <laughs> think that one. Made by the professional. Time to plate it up. That's looking beautiful. You're a lot neater doing this than I am. I'll yeah. take like a spoonful of them and just yeah. drop it on there and then arrange them on the plate. Ah, pro tip. And of course, the finishing touches. Wow. That is our scallop aguachile. And I helped make it. Can something this pretty taste as good as it looks? That looks like a good bite. Mm. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yet so simple. Thank you, sir. Al, it was a pleasure. Fantastic. The Haas avocado may have started out as a lucky surprise, but for decades, its popularity has been no accident. The Mexican-American culinary traditions passed down through the years have made this delicious and nutritious fruit a staple for so many of us across the country. And thanks to generations of enterprising families, this bumpy green fruit is going to have a very long shelf life. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960. Or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists. And Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eater is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Ducky Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. 
post-1865 in the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace but that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, the list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time, they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. Gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter Four. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey. 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 Enjoying everything. We it's are great enjoying food. everything. Yeah. Yeah. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase, Chase to, to get, get myself my some gumbo. When, when the service, service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. 
And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks who are in the North, they still experience poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's. Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination 
and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so, he, yeah. after a meal here, after yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? 
Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, Sylvia so, so used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. No, is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh-huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there? Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now this now is you're a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're going person. for. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you. Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come. 
great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here but there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized, but in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activist Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. 
It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Oh, oh pie there. Craig Melvin here, filling in for Al Roker on this episode of Family Style. And today, well today we're talking, talking all about one of the country's most popular desserts and a holiday staple. 